Once again, good morning, distinguished colleagues. I would like to thank everybody for finding the opportunity and joining us today in our session, not only here in the offline format within the World Trade Center, but also I think those who is joined online. I see that a lot of colleagues are watching us online and uh, participate in this session in the remote format. And so today, within our reports and discussions, if you have any questions, our speakers will be very glad to answer them in an online format as well as in the offline format. I would like to open this session of today's, which is called the development of regional and global networks to detect and respond uh, for epidemiological emergencies. And today, during our session, we will listen to Dr. Yuka Pukula from the WHO Regional Office for Europe. the team leader of the Division of Health Emergencies and uh, Communicable Diseases. Then we'll listen to Igor Karnaukov, the head of the epidemiology at Microbe, the research institute. Then we'll listen to Elena Shamal, the advisor of the Department of Cooperation and Social Affairs, Administration of Humanitarian Cooperation, Political and Social Affairs, CIS Executive Committee. And then we will listen to Dmitry Lyoznov. He is the director of the Research Institute of Influenza Russia. So the pandemic of the novel coronavirus infection has shown us the importance and great significance of uh, networks the groups of people, as well as the importance of uh, communications. It all helps us to identify in a timely manner and respond to some outbreaks of diseases. The networks, or in other words, these groups of people can be built upon absolutely different characteristics. There could be some professional networks that deal with the transfer of information from uh, one epidemiologist to another one. There are also other networks compiled upon the ge geographical criteria, for example, the CIS countries council. There are some other networks as well that gather some medical professionals who work in order to respond to emergencies, in order to help to respond to such emergencies, for example, as the outbreak of infectious diseases. For example, we have a global network on the informing and responding on the uh, infectious diseases, uh, the Quarant City network. There are some other networks that are being coordinated by WHO. And here, I mean the network of contact peoples on the international health regulations. And I'm sure that the next presenter will tell us about this network and about how it was functioning during the outbreak of the novel coronavirus infection. So I invite you to listen to the presentations that will tell you about different formats and uh, ways how to unite people, professionals, and I also invite you to think about how our activities regarding the response to the novel coronavirus infection in the end of the last year and in the beginning of, the, of this present year, how it influenced the ways of the existence of these networks, how the networks become more useful and demanded or less? What are the challenges? What lessons can we draw from the function of these networks? What can we learn from the ways that people communicate with each other, how the information is transferred, and how it all influences the outbreaks of infectious diseases as well as other emergencies? And so now I'd like to give the floor to our first speaker, Dr. Yuka Pukula, the team leader, Division of Health Emergencies and Communicable Diseases at WHO Regional Office for Europe. Yuka, 
Hope you can hear us. Please, the floor is yours. You can say it again. Hello, our, our colleague, they're not here. Can you hear me? It's Yuka Pukila here. Yes, you can. I can we can hear, hear you. But not any others. Okay, Dr. Lyosnov yes. is, is on call. I can, uh, can see him, but I'm not sure if he's on call. So can I start my presentation? Yes, you can start. Please go ahead. Confusion. I'm sharing my slides. Can you see my? Can you see my slide? Da you can. Yes, we can share. We can see your screen. It's all working all right. So. Good morning to everybody, <clears throat> respected chair, the hosts, and the <coughs> organizers, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. And my name is Jukka Pukkila. I work in the WSO Regional Office for Europe in Copenhagen, and I'm the program area manager for so-called Health Emergency Information and Risk Assessment Department under the WSO emergency program for, for, for Europe and, and the key task of um, my, my and my team's key tasks is to function as the international health regulations con regional contact point for the Europe, maintaining the 24-7 duty officer so we are always available for communication with all the 55 <coughs> international uh, ISR national focal points in all the European countries. And I have been in this job since 2010 in charge of these ISR communications. So 11 years out of the 14 years when the ISR 2005 has been in, in force. I start my presentation in a bit unusual manner by immediately bringing up the, the key messages or basically the conclusions what I would like to highlight during my presentation. And when speaking about new networks and then developing further regional and global networks for, for managing uh, public health emergencies and especially epidemics and outbreaks, I still would like to draw everybody's attention that we already have a very uh, long history and, 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 and well-developed basic framework, legally binding framework of the internet health regulations that we would need to, <coughs> to, to, to make, um, make fully functional. And I can say that during these 11 years, I have never seen that this, uh, these formal IHR communications regulated by Article 6 to 11 of the IHR between WHO and the national IHR focal points and between various national IHR focal points has, would have been working as rapidly and as completely and as well it has, that it has been working from the very beginning of the outbreak in the European region in January 2020. There are only very few exceptions where the, uh, this, this has not been working. But the COVID pandemic has clearly shown to everybody how it affects all sectors of the society and how everybody needs to be involved in managing this. And this has been always the basic message on the IHR that it is not a specific <coughs> task or network for ministries of health or even more narrowly just for this IHR national focal point, which tends to happen sometimes that everything is left to them. It really <coughs> is supposed to be a whole of government business and, and, and we will need to get it <coughs> implemented uh, as in, in the whole of all sectors on the basis of whole of government and then we need strong political commitment from the highest levels of the government and as from the society as a whole to get the IHR working as it was intended to work. So although 
some sections of the some parts of the ads are have been working extremely well during the pandemic there's definitely much space for improvement then and of course the national lights are focal points are not the only <coughs> network network there are uh, many many uh, nine nine or more core capacity areas under IHR and there are specialized networks like for laboratories for points of entry <coughs> and uh, for for many others already existing already outside the NFPs the functioning of the IHR during the, uh, the COVID pandemic is now being very carefully examined with an uh, independent IHR review committee. They also examined the functioning of the IHR after the 2009-2010 H1N1 influenza pandemic and after the 2014-2016 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And now they have been doing ex extensive work work on the functioning of the IHR and they will present maybe not their final results, but at least their findings so far during the World Health Assembly now in May, next month in May. And, and I would encourage all the member states to pay attention and proactively participate in these discussions, how we can further improve the implementation and perhaps even the content of the IHR in going forward to make it do what it was intended, designed to do. And then just a short look into the history. So the IHR actually goes back a couple of hundred of years. It actually initiates from those yellow flags from 17th century when the uh, ships they required if they had uh, serious communicable diseases on board to stay out from the harbor and put a yellow flag into the mast as a sign of the quarantine before they were allowed then to, to, to dock and embark. And, and that is why the first international health regulations booklet was also yellow and the, 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 the <coughs> yellow card is, is, is under rights are is that color. And the, during the existence of WHO since 1947, the first uh, form of international health regulations were the international sanitary regulations that were adopted in 1951 in the fourth World Health Assembly. Then they were first uh, further developed and then and, and the first edition of the international health regulation was and, uh, uh, approved in World Health Assembly in 1969, but this, uh, this first edition concentrated on certain communicable diseases only. And in 2000, uh, 1995, the World Health Assembly requested a revision of this IHR. It was seen that the situation has changed the, the, in terms of the volume and speed of international travel and trade, and also that communicable diseases are only some of the public health emergencies the, the, that the IHR should cover all hazards, including chemical, environmental, radionuclear emergencies, and so on. So there was then 10 years of negotiation between the countries to come up with a new version of the IHR, and the, that was then adopted in the World Health Assembly in 2005 and entered into force 15th of June 2007. So it is now soon 14 years when the <coughs> latest version of the IHR has been in force. And, and it, it's a legally binding for 196 state parties, practically all countries of the world. 55 of these state parties in the European region, even we have only 53 member states, but since Vatican, the Holy See, and the Principality Liechtenstein are also so-called states parties <coughs> to IHR, we have 55 in the European region. Then I'm not the only text from the IHR itself that I included in the presentation is the Article 2 that provides the purpose and scope of the international health regulations, the, the, the current 
version and I'm not going to read it aloud here but that really when you go through the text you can see that this is exactly the purpose of the international health regulation to be able to rapidly <coughs> to prevent and to rapidly control and respond to public health emergencies caused by any any hazard so this is really something that we already have and we should be building on then I have sometimes tendency to go, I don't think that there are many IHR national focal points and it's not the purpose to speak about the details of the IHR <coughs> architecture and key functions, but I want to highlight <coughs> the, national, the central role of the, of the national IHR focal point in the system. And, and then that means the, this national lights are focal point really needs to be an institution and an institution that is centrally located and has access to all the required information uh, both from health sector but also from from other sectors and, and of course they cannot function if the national health system and, and, and surveillance and response systems are not functioning both in the health sector and in other <coughs> sectors here early warning and surveillance of, of events is required. And for us, the National ISR focal point for WHO is the key <coughs> counterpart. So we always go to the National ISR focal point. We don't bypass the ISR NFP in WHO. And there are the formal communications regulated by Article 6 to 11 of the ISR in terms of especially this early detection, assessment, reporting, and mounting an untimely and appropriate response to any public health emergency, <coughs> serious public health emergency. So these are the formal communications that are uh, very precisely defined. Then I have to say about the notification that unfortunately the language is a bit negative and then many times it feels that the countries think that having to notify something on the rights are to WHO is a failure. We see it as a great success and then a sign that the surveillance system and early warning systems in the country, country work, so it should never be seen as a failure. When in doubt, rather notify than not notify <coughs> and their, uh, the, to, to WHO. And then these are really the formal uh, it's our communications in this part of the, the work and then almost as an extra plus there is now the global network of 196 national lights are focal points and and every national lights are focal point has has a contact details so they are free to contact any other national focal point anywhere in the world to share information we, as a WSO regional contact point, we never contact the national ISR focal points in other regions. We go then through the region, respective region offices and with, uh, through headquarters. But you, as the national ISR focal points, are absolutely free to contact each other. And this is used more and more. We are not at all copied all the time, so we don't even know how much this <coughs> network is being utilized but but it is increasingly being utilized and, and uh, especially for international contact tracing purposes and, and we try to facilitate that this would be, become even more easy and effective to share confidential information between countries through this then concentrating on the very beginning of the pandemic i'm just highlighting some uh, uh, what what has happened using the ihr during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a link to the timeline of one year of WHO Europe response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The whole so-called incident management system team, so it's not limited to us and or the, only to the IHR, but there is a day-by-day cases at that the timeline that you can scroll and see the key events and developments what happened, so I encourage you to visit that one. So already in January, when we learned about this <coughs> outbreak in, in, in China, and whenever when, when the virus was identified in the very beginning of January, WHO shared case definitions <coughs> of, 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 of this new disease and guidance on the 
mandatory notification and reporting of all probable and then confirmed COVID cases to WHO. And, and indeed, in 20, Friday evening, 24th of January, France was in the European region the first country to notify the first COVID cases in the Europe. And then other countries, as you might recall, followed in very rapid succession. And whenever we got the information on the first case, we provided a package of the, the, the guidance documents and, and, and also uh, forms for, for case-based reporting and so on. And we initiated communication with the countries. The notification is never once off event. It is always the beginning of the communication. And we had with many countries uh, a series of video conferences to, to understand what exactly is going on in these countries, especially in, with, with Germany, France, UK, Italy. Anyway, you can see those in the timeline, the various. And then we use the existing information sharing channel, the restricted channel for sharing confidential information with all ISR national focal points. It's called so-called event information site for in the ISR national focal points, EIS. And then whenever there was a new country, we <coughs> were posting information on that unless the country for some reason did not want to do that. But it became immediately <coughs> clear that this is much too rigid and slow reporting in this extremely rapidly evolving situation. So we <coughs> developed the interactive active COVID 19 dashboards in uh, both in English and Russian that came online on public webs uh, on uh, 20th February 2020 and has been updated in terms of uh, new cases and deaths every day, uh, 24 uh, every day, including weekends and all holidays ever, ever since. And this is the first time really that we are counting cases when we have over 140 million cases globally and approaching 50 million cases in, in Europe and that's never been done. Again, here is the, the main page of the dashboard that has become now the most visited ever on WSO Europe website. It has already <coughs> over 10 million visits until now and then it's visited all the time and, and, and then when we are going we have been adding different information and features there unfortunately on the Russian website we had the, <coughs> the basic numbers you can see the total number of cases per country and also the 15, 14 day incidence you can select the view <coughs> but then the more complete set is only unfortunately available on the English dashboard site and the most popular nowadays is the subnational uh, explorer that is also interactive and where you can see uh, we also update it on a daily basis you can see we don't have the subnational data for quite all countries but most of the countries we do have and it really shows where uh, the, the, the pandemic is evolving and how the pandemic is evolving just now i strongly I encourage you to visit this subnational explorer. There's a list on the whole Europe of all the regions with the highest <coughs> seven-day incidence. You can see that the Croatia, Sweden, France, this is from Monday. They're, they're leading there. Then, as already mentioned, there are the many, many other, other networks and then the most important being the joint WSO Europe ECDC flu and network where all the, the European member states belong and then where meets this simultaneous translation every two, uh, two weeks and the next meeting is actually uh, on Friday, day after tomorrow. So this is the key network and it has been now expanded from flu to cover also COVID with a COVID surveillance focal point nominated by most countries. And, and then there are other networks for the response. There is the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network and the Emergency Medical Teams Network, where Rosport Repnatsor is a member. 
active active member already so this is on the response side of the and, and, and since we have a presentation on, on, on the respiratory surveillance network i don't need to speak more about that i just provided some of the key links to the key networks here but i would like, like to uh, in the end to to, to highlight uh, European Mortality Monitoring Activity or Euromomo network that is supported both, both by WSO Euro and, and ECDC and is actually managed by the Danish Start and Serum Institute. And they are collecting weekly data on excess mortality by any course. And they would very much welcome additional members to join this members. The Israel and Ukraine just joined very recently, but otherwise there's a gap in, in, in Eastern European and, and Central Asian countries. So if you are interested, please pass the message and consider of joining this network to give, get a more comprehensive picture of the excess mortality in the European region. And in the very end, sorry, I know that I have gone over time, but I still included these key messages with which I started but I'm not going to go through. It's only the key message is that let's get international health regulation truly to work as they were intended to work to become a really, really significant tool for the prevention and control of future epidemics and pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuka, uh, uh, for your very interesting uh, presentation about uh, ISR and the network of national uh, coordinators of ISR. And I really hope that distinguished colleagues have got a good understanding on how this network is working and how it is cooperating with other networks that are shaped, for example, on the basis of professional um, occupancy of specialists, laboratory professionals within the laboratory activities, or like the networks formed on the basis of uh, certain nosologies, um, like in flu or influenza cases on global, regional and sub-regional level. Yuka, I would like uh, to ask you not to turn, uh, not, not to leave our today's session before it will end, because after uh, all the presentations we will have Q&A session and your participation will be very valuable. Thank you. And now I would like to let the floor to the next presenter, Igor Karnaukhov head of the Department of Epidemiology of Microbe Institute at uh, the uh, Russian uh, uh, Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-being. The floor is yours. Thank you. Greetings, distinguished colleagues. Today, I want to show you bits and pieces of information on the measures that were taken and are taken in the EECA region uh, in terms of uh, shaping of unified emergency response system for epidemiological threats in a sanitary and epidemiological uh, field. Could you please manage my slides? Well, as uh, Alek Nikolaevich today told us, and I also want to stress it out that pandemics of COVID-19 was a kind of a trigger for shaping of different formats, uh, facilitating the systems of counteraction uh, and uniting our efforts in counteraction the pandemics. But again, in this case, I want to state clearly that the events on shaping of this unified, united system of reaction in the EECA regions, so Eastern Europe and Central Asia, they are facilitated during the last seven years. That means that the 
program was initiated in 2015. And I wanted to stress out the fact that the Russian Federation uh, was uh, consec consecutively supporting the idea of introduction and realization of international sanitary rules starting from 2015. And uh, uh, together with the support of the government of Russian Federation starting from 2015, we are realizing the program that, that which aim is to render the methodological and material and technical support to the partner countries. Countries partnered with Russia in um, terms of introduction of uh, international sanitary rules and support of these rules. And these programs are aimed on uh, uh, backing up of the national potential of the countries, methodology, technology, also staff potential. It all is leading to enhancement of national possibilities uh, and capabilities of states in uh, the field of sanitary and epidemiological surveillance. And at the end of the day, realization of these programs is aimed on creation, in the first line, of a united information and epidemiological space for the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And secondly, it is aimed on the creation of a united system of monitoring and operative emergency response for epidemiological threats in ECA. And I also wanted to state that along with the realization of these programs, a leading role is played by the Russian Anti-Plague Institute Microp at the Russian Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Well-Being, which is the leading organization from the 2015 uh, within the uh, Coordination Council for the problems uh, of uh, epidemiological threats uh, on the territory of uh, CIS. And again, when we speak about CIS and ECA, and we're jumping from uh, one region to the other, like Central Euro uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia and CIS, we understand that Eastern Europe and Central Asia is not a union of states, but this is... Um, just a mere space uniting the Eastern Europe countries and Central Asia. But when we speak about CIS, this is already official existing union of uh, independent countries and states, and all the member states of CIS are still uh, within uh, the borders of the EECA. And this is just a commentary from my side, because I will speak uh, partly in my presentation about EECA and the CIS. Correspondently. The next slide, please. Here you may see the main directions of our cooperations within the framework of the programs that I was speaking about. For example, this is uh, cooperative field work, uh, expeditions in cooperation uh, in terms of monitoring of uh, outbreaks, uh, natural outbreaks uh, of. Uh, of pest and other uh, infectious diseases. And I need to state that this field work uh, was renewed and reconsidered after a long break within uh, due to the realization of the named programs. This is also execution of uh, cooperative uh, research works, scientific works. Uh, training of uh, medical staff and specialists, which is uh, already and every time a uh, topic for us. And we are using different forms of uh, such trainings, like training courses, uh, online, off offline uh, courses, uh, trainings on the basis of Federal Service of Surveillance and Consumer Rights, uh, Protection and Human Well-Being seminars, and other types of trainings. We are providing for betterment of information and analytical works and support uh, within uh, our work. Uh, we are developing analytical and informational systems, which I will uh, disclose a bit later. And we are also supporting material and technical basis, hardware basis of um, profile agencies of the countries of EECA. And we've performed and uh, are ever performing the deliveries of laboratory equipment, diagnostic drugs and substances and um, other substances and materials 
also with uh, car-based uh, mobile laboratories. Next slide, please. And further on, you may see the main results of our cooperation within uh, the realization or along the realization of the programs that I stated already. Starting from 2015 to 2020, we've delivered 18 mobile laboratories to the six countries of the CIS. And here in the upper left corner, you may see this microbiological laboratory for express diagnostics on the basis of gazelle uh, car type. So this is a universal chassis that is uh, uh, hosting uh, all types of diagnostics like uh, polymerase chain reaction, immune uh, reaction, luminescent microscopy, immune chromatography analysis. And together with this, we are providing to the countries of uh, EECA mobile laboratories that are uh, the part of a mobile SPEB complex uh, at the Russian Federal Service for Soviets on Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-being. We are dealing with Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Belarus Republic, and we are pl planning to work with Kyrgyz Republic, which is uh, already stated uh, on one of the sessions yesterday, uh, Astabek Kabilovic from Kyrgyz Republic is uh, now saying yes to this and supporting these activities. And we ran uh, already uh, a lineup of courses preparing uh, more than 200 specialists in uh, the matters, in the first line, in the matters related to the programs of uh, the specialized anti-epidemics uh, gr group uh, of uh, response groups. And as of now, we are dealing with the issue of uh, creation of a registry of specialists, profile institutes and agencies, state bodies within the CIS countries that uh, uh, already are covered by the training program of uh, the emergency response groups trainings and uh, who have professional compet competencies, knowledge base to work in case of a necessity within uh, a mobile complex of uh, the emergency response uh, for epidemiological threats. And when I speak about the united information epidemiological uh, space uh, and uh, modeling of uh, better exchange and information we have provided for these purposes automatized uh, workplaces, I mean here computer devices, uh, digital devices that are corresponding to the certain criteria and I mean modern computer devices right now into uh, eight countries we have delivered 18 automized uh, servers and on the U United Server of Microbe Institute, we have uh, digital programs for monitoring of uh, natural outbreaks and emergency response uh, system. And on the next slide, you may see that as of today, the Microbe Institute has a huge practical experience especially within the scope of reaction to the or response to the urgent emergency uh, or in the uh, epidemiological threats and our specialists are ready to share their experience their best practices to all parties concerned on uh, within the EECA and the first line uh, with the representatives of the CIS countries what is our experience you may see it on the slide this is a participation in uh, fighting Ebola in Guinea Republic from 2014 to 2016. And by the way, there, uh, at the time of 2014, we've uh, launched a group of specialists from the Microbe Institute and Vector Center at the uh, Russian Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Well-being, and two special modules of uh, the um, Unified Emergency Response complexes that uh, were left in Guinea Republic as uh, the gift from the uh, from Russia. And as of now, these modules are uh, in good operating state there, and they are working autonomously autonomously from the autonomous electro generators starting from 2014 and now it is 2021 so you can imagine but 
And so why we do all that? Because in the Republic of Guinea there are some problems with the power generation and we cannot work just on the baseline of the regular power grids. And um, our equipment or high equipment of a high cost can just get out of order. And so this is the fact that speaks on its own. Our equipment working autonomously is quite a reliable one and one can work on this equipment against some difficult conditions. And of course, it's very important that taking into account the experience and expertise of work in the Republic of Guinea, within uh, one year, back in 2016, we created the mobile unit of the emergency response of the second generation. And uh, alongside uh, a set of parameters, it is uh, well ahead of the unit of the first generation. And uh, here we also have some training facility to train some personnel for this mobile units. And back in 2019, before COVID-19, we managed to conduct a large-scale international training, it took part, it took place in the city of Saratov. We fully deployed the mobile unit of the emergency response and uh, 72 specialists and professionals from uh, eight CIS countries uh, took part in that, 82 professionals from eight countries. And this training was quite uh, a successful one. We addressed some epidemiological tasks as well as we conducted some research of uh, the samples, of lab samples. We decoded all that, sequenced, analyzed and uh, it was actually the first time when we conducted such a large-scale intergovernmental study and training. And uh, also we published uh, a guideline, a book, upon the results of this training. And this is a book about the international emergency measures on the territory of EECA. Next slide, please. Another accent that I would like to put in here is that our institute, Microbe, has been researching and developing mobile laboratories uh, since 2006. We got obtained 20 patents for the mobile laboratories of the different profiles. Here in the picture you can see some photos of these laboratories. So we have the express laboratories, so the express diagnostics. Uh, the first one appeared in 2006 and uh, it was the laboratory of uh, indication and uh, the epidemiological surveillance and reconnaissance, reconnaissance. Then we've got the second generation of these laboratories back in 2015. So this is a laboratory of express diagnostics. And uh, we supply them to CIS countries. That's what I mentioned before. And as of today, we've already developed the laboratory of the third generation. This is the laboratory of uh, indication. You can see it uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, in the middle of it. So the third uh, generation laboratory is quite different from the previous ones. It was uh, quite re-equipped and one can say that this is a new level in developing the mobile labs. In 2017, we developed and designed the mobile laboratory for the monitoring and diagnostics. Is, it was based uh, in the Kamaz uh, vehicle and uh, it is uh, aimed at the research of uh, epistemological monitoring when it comes to the natural foci of plague and some other infections. Next one, please.
And here I can't help but mentioning our cooperation with our uh, regional European office of WHO. Since we are talking about the network uh, within EECA, but we do understand that all this is interconnected, and I believe that Oleg uh, would support my words. And here I'd like to mention that the European Office of WHO with the participation of the Institute of Robert Koch and Federal Service for the Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being, uh, we developed the typology of the mobile labs and uh, we identified and distinguished five types of the laboratories and you can see all these five types on this slide. And in Microbe Institute, as of today, we have all the types, perhaps except the first one, the super small labs, we don't have this one, but all the rest of the types uh, are presented and uh, are located in our institute. And this year, we conduct some active work con jointly with the European Office of WHO, and we try to achieve such tasks as the development of minimal standards for the mobile laboratories. We also are working on the information support on logistics. We are also working on the organization of international training and drills. And Anna Yurovna mentioned it yesterday in her speech. We plan to organize these kind of drills in autumn this year in the city of Kazan in Russia. Of course, if uh, everything goes well. And we hope that the current pandemic will not thwart our plans. And on the, base, on the basis of our Microbe Institute, we are working on the creation of uh, the coordinating center of WHO on the uh, preparedness or on being prepared to the pandemics and some responsive measures against the backdrop of emergencies. Well, it's quite a novel work for us. This is uh, absolutely another level. I believe that this is a very useful and valuable work when it comes to the experience and expertise and skills that we will get. It is very useful also within the un unified and common network on the territory of EECA. Once again, I'd like to underline that all these processes are intensively interconnected. Well, one does understand that any cooperation in any field, in any area, across every profile and function should be supported by the regulatory and methodological documents. These documents could turn this cooperation into kind of a structured work. And we also work on this. We've been actually working on this for quite a number of years. And uh, we do it within the Functioning Coordination Council of CIS on the sanitary protection of the territories. I need to say that it was created back in 2000. And uh, over this time, we've conducted 14 regular meetings. And um, in 2020 and in 2021, we've already conducted and held uh, seven irregular meetings in a video conference format. These meetings were devoted to the problem of COVID-19. And within the activities of this coordinating council, we developed uh, drafted two very important documents, in my opinion. First, this is the uh, document on the information exchange between CIS countries on emergency situations 
and uh, this is done within the creation of a common info information epidemiological space. And the second document is the draft agreement on the cooperation of CIS countries in the field of uh, the response to the emergency situations in the field of uh, public health uh, of the sanitary and uh, epidemiological field. So the first document, uh, the provision on the cooperation within the CIS countries, it has already been uh, adopted. The second document has been approved and currently it is going, uh, undergoing as an internal approval within the national states and after that it will be submitted to the Council of uh, the Prime Ministers of CIS countries. Next slide, please. And another aspect that I believe to be very important. Today, we conduct some work on the creation of the baseline of fundamental organization of CIS countries. It will monitor, inform, and uh, collectively respond to emergencies of uh, the epidemiological and sanitary nature. Rospotrebnadzor, the Russian Federal Service for uh, Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being, submitted to, to, to the meeting of the Executive uh, Committee. The Executive Committee approved, uh, adopted this initiative, and I believe that this year we will review this issue within the Economic Council. Yes, I see that Helena Vladimirovna notes that uh, it will definitely take place. We hope that this provision will be adopted. The main target of this organization, uh, you can actually see some targets on this slide and I'll probably not read all of them. Now let's pass to the conclusions. I've already presented to you the, the main elements of our work, the pillars. But the main conclusion is that as of today, resulting from the activities that we've been doing for the seventh year already, we've built a unified system of monitoring and time response to emergency situations of uh, sanitary and epidemiological nature uh, in EECA. We unite more than 15 profile units and we also have created the Situation and Coordinating Center on the base of uh, the body, the unit that is working under the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being of Russia. So this is a permanent process. It is not, it has not ended. To make the system work properly, one has to be in constant uh, interaction, cooperation. We have to conduct continuous work to that extent, and we do this. And the colleagues who are present in this room today are well aware of all this, and they support us across all our deliberations here. And so I hope that we will continue to uh, conduct some active work in this respect. And I hope that uh, due to our joint efforts, we'll achieve some good results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Igor Gennadievich, for your extensive and informative report. It was very important for us to know more about the coordinate, coordinating role of uh, your institute and uh, uh, the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being on the territory of EECA. Uh, thank you very much for your good words on the cooperation of your institute, the Federal Service uh, on Consumer Rights Protection and uh, the WHO European Office. Uh, we'll give the opportunity for questions uh, to our audience after uh, all the presentations are done. And now I'd like to give the floor to our our next uh, presenter, who is Elena Shamal from uh, CIS Executive Committee. And uh, her presentation sounds very interesting, uh, which is the COVID-19 pandemic lost opportunities and new horizons. Elena, the floor is yours, please.
Can you please put my presentation on the screen? Dear colleagues, can I use the clicker? Or, oh, okay, I see that it works. All right. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. As um, everybody has already said, this topic, the traditional, uh, this year, the traditional topic of the conference that has always been about HIV and AIDS. Uh, uh, this year it has been extended and widened and um, over these two days we are talking about the epidemiological well-being, about different issues within this context. And of course this is uh, far from a coincidence. I see something happening with the screen. The world situation uh, of COVID-19 is quite tense, and it persists to be tense. The situation in CIS countries with COVID-19 also persists to be quite intensive. So we see that the uh, average indicators uh, across all the countries are more or less the same, but the Armenia and Moldova uh, stand out a bit of this context. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we were working in CIS within the three main documents. First, the agreement on cooperation in the field of healthcare. It was adopted back in 1992. Then the agreement on cooperation in the field of uh, sanitary protection uh, back uh, in 2001, it was adopted. And the next one, the agreement on the cooperation between CIS countries in the field of emergencies and the creation of uh, emergencies. Uh, it was approved in uh, adopted in 2015. So COVID-19 is indeed uh, the challenge to the whole humanity and uh, one country cannot stand alone in it. And here the international cooperation plays uh, one of the key roles and occupies one of the most important places. Then the Executive Committee of CIS countries within the international cooperation uh, interacts with uh, more than 25 international organizations. The main partners of ours are the UN, the WHO, and UNAIDS. The main um, body when it comes to the cooperation within uh, the healthcare. This is the Council on the Healthcare, and uh, it consists of the ministers of health and uh, the chief sanitary physicians from 10 CS countries. Uh, this year, the chair country is the Republic of Belarus, and uh, the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing is the leader in terms of the sanitary and epidemiological well-being. And with the satisfaction, I can mention that uh, starting from the very beginning of the pandemic uh, in CIS, we've been cooperating quite in a timely manner. Last year, the heads of our states uh, met twice. And the topic that were topics uh, that were discussed, uh, the topics on the COVID-19 were also discussed uh, within the uh, ministers of uh, foreign affairs as well as the ministers of health and chief sanitary physicians of CIS countries. A bit, bit later, I'll talk about the role of the coordination council that fights against the spread and uh, bringing in of. Um, contagious diseases. And we also have created a working group to analyze the COVID situation. And uh, on a weekly basis, we publish information uh, bulletins. Uh, last week, we published the 55th uh, bulletin. And another information platform that has been uh, given to us uh, by Macrobe Institute, you can take a look at it. And in an online format, uh, you can read uh, easily and write easily 
your observations and opinions. So yesterday, uh, those who participated in our sessions, you probably remember that Anna Yurovna Popova mentioned and underlined one of the main documents that was adopted by the Council of the Prime Ministers. This is the statement uh, in connection to the novel coronavirus infection. and. Uh, the initiative came from uh, Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing. It was uh, reviewed uh, in the Coordinating Council. And this statement uh, says that the pandemic is indeed a threat to the whole humanity and the CIS uh, member states are aimed at intensive cooperation to fight uh, against this uh, novel disease infectious disease and separately the statement underlines the cooperation within the council on uh, the cooperation and also there is an order to develop some new documents on not only fight against the coronavirus COVID-19 but also to establish some strategic approaches how to prevent infectious diseases. In 2020, there were two uh, meetings of the ministers of health care and uh, chief sanitary physicians. And the first meeting was uh, the urgent emergency. And the, uh, there was only one topic, what do we do, how we will interact with uh, COVID-19. And the members of the board discussed the um, measures taken in the member states, quarantine, events and the efficiency of quarantine and also we managed to urgently develop and discuss and promulgate five documents on our cooperation within the sanitary and epidemiological well-being and the meeting of 28th october 2020 was more um, profound and the members of the council discussed the organizational functioning of the healthcare systems during covid period um, understanding that we are not only uh, putting our efforts in uh, fighting the infection, but we also have huge groups of population that need uh, to get help rendered independently of the epidemiological situation in the countries. We also discussed facilitation of works uh, f related to the patients with diabetes mellitus, oncology, and according to the Belarus Republic initiative, uh, the set of information materials for the patients with diabetes was developed with the proper recommendations on what to do and how to use it. We also put an accent on uh, the emotional and psychological well-being of patients and medical staff and uh, within the framework on uh, the council, we have a basic organization in uh, psychiatry and narcology that is working along this line of works and introducing its own recommendations. A midterm plan. As you may see, this document is also supporting the uh, decree of the Council of the Heads of States, and the main idea is the prevention of epidemic of infectious diseases in member states in general and building up on potential in uh, uh, fighting against the infections. There are five directions, 23 events along this plan. And as Igor Gennadievich in his report stated, he also put some accents, we are uh, going toward the shaping of the overall legal basis and development of the registry of specialists, members of specialized unified emergency response uh, groups. Uh, we are also developing programs for support of these specialists, trainings of these specialists, and support of their operational readiness. I will later dis describe why do we need this. And in um, part of the development of scientific potential, we are planning the development of uh, cooperative research in immune biological drugs development and other drugs development, uh, scientific expeditions, uh, offline works, aimed on actualization of information on uh, the nature sources of uh, plague. So the plan, uh, the plan will be realized uh, in 2021-2022. 
for two years. Uh, as Igor Gennadievich stated, we've started the work on uh, the agreement in cooperation within the scope of sanitary protection. During the 20 years of cooperation within this agreement, uh, there were more than epide 10 epidemics and pandemics in the world. The uh, international sanitary rules are adopted. And, uh, and uh, again, our work was started before pandemics. And we've planned to introduce changes as a protocol. But now we understand that taking into account the global situation and the features and changes that we are introducing into the international document, today we are ready to provide for a signature of the heads of state the agreement in a new edition. While working on this agreement, we were taking into account not only the necessity of a clear realization and adherence to the medical sanitary rules, but we were one step ahead because we understand that one year or two, in one or two years, the whole world will interact within the international classification of diseases of uh, 11th uh, edition. And in this context, we are also introducing changes and to the agreement we've attached a list of the diseases for the member states of CIS. Uh, that will be uh, supported by the sanitary epidemiological uh, events, respectively. Distinguished colleagues, I want to recall that the pandemics of COVID is not only one question that we're dealing with within our cooperation in uh, prevention of infectious diseases. On the territory of member states of CIS, we have 45 hertz of uh, 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 plague and by the way in 2019 the coordination council developed methodology or uh, methodological recommendations that contain uh, the consecutive works and directions for main control and uh, pre prevention uh, of this uh, hazardous infection on the territory of CIS. Is it a joke or not a joke? But still, I want to say that uh, while I was preparing to the uh, report today, there was a document that was adopted in 2019 with a slight glaze of irony. Because in 2019, we were not under a transport collapse. Uh, there was uh, a passenger circulation on aviation. Passenger flows on the CIS uh, included tens of dozens of millions, and in the world there were hundreds of millions passengers. And thanks God, today we are going out of this uh, state of limits. But uh, according to the initiative of Belarus Republic, there were two documents developed that re re regulate medical provisions for aviation companies, peculiarities in rendering of medical services to the passengers and crew members uh, at, during uh, within the framework of operations of civil aviation. And uh, one document that uh, let me smile were the meta methodological recommendations for organization and handling of sanitary anti-epidemic events in case of um, uh, the uh, dead body or uh, live person opposing the emergency uh, and uh, having the international significance at flight within uh, civil aviation. So we were prepared, although we did not know to what. And distinguished colleagues, as of now, we have a good grade of readiness of one more international document, and this is the draft of agreement on the CIS for prevention and reaction for emergency situations within the epidemiological threats. Uh, the ones who were online and offline yesterday on the presentation on the report of uh, activities of uh, the emergency response groups, today our first presenter also touched upon this topic. And this agreement draft has uh, the goal to regulate uh, the activities of emergency response groups in, uh, emer in different emergency situations to make it easier to uh, make cross-border um, transportation of these groups. And it goes out of the framework of the ministries of health care. Uh, here we are inviting for the de development of this document the customs 
uh, border agencies and we are optimizing the approaches to shaping of the emergency response uh, systems. Um, we are analyzing their territorial presence and on the 10th of June we have planned the next meeting on the discussion of this agreement and we hope that at the end of this year we will be able to pass it for the supreme organs of the uh, CIS. As Igor Gennadievich told in his presentation uh, about the activities of Coordination Council during pandemics, and in 20 years of this Coordination Council, uh, it showed its unity and professional approach in uh, the uh, challenging issues and questions. There are representatives of all 11 member states within this Council and on uh, the sittings of the Council, operative meetings of the Council, the members of the board are discussing different topics. And with every meeting, the list of questions is um, being wider and wider. Because if at the beginning of our cooperation there were questions like how, where, and what to do within the framework of special services, what are the events to be imposed, what is uh, working, what is not working, how to organize uh, the activities in schools, in um, healthcare system, the topics still are very wide. And today these issues, these questions are also getting a new status of the, the development of knowledge on immunization, use of specific and non-specific prevention, uh, preventive tools. And I want to say that the WHO, practically speaking, is uh, cooperating with us on every meeting. Uh, we have presenters from WHO and uh, Alek Nikolaevich. I want to thank you for this, especially because you are also our colleague and participant of all of these events. And as Igor Gennadievich already told during the first presentation that in this year, um, the platform of uh, Microbe Institute is planned to be uh, established as a basic organization. And this was the idea um, that uh, was fostered starting from 2003, because from 2003, Microbe Institute is the basis for operative and informational exchange for the situations and for a certain list of inf infectious diseases. Therefore, we have many, um, many works that are finalized. We have preliminary uh, um, we have preliminary acceptance, and on the 14th of June, the status of basis organization will be provided for the Institute Microbe. And as I already told, the vaccine prevention as of now is one of uh, very important topics, study of immune status, uh, the pace of uh, immune prevention. We wanted to increase it, but still, I hope that the platform for manufacturing of vaccines Sputnik V in the Belarus, in Kazakhstan in Belarus Republic it will correct the situation and this issue or this question will be enhanced and distinguished colleagues the year 2020 was challenging and in December 2020 there was the first meeting that was held not only in online mode but also in personal mode uh, in uh, offline mode uh, within the CIS. This was the international conference organized uh, by the R Russian Federal Service for Soviets on Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Well-being. We were discussing COVID and mobile laboratories were handed over to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. One more international platform, as I stated, is the UN. And this year, we also had a meeting with the Secretary General at the UN in discussing of cooperation of international organization, uh, organizations in fighting against COVID-19. The year 2020 is a challenging year, not only due to COVID-19, but we also remember that the states uh, got this obligation for uh, implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and, of course, HIV and tuberculosis. SDG issues are in the field of our view and uh, there is a state uh, accepted obligation and on the platform of CIS our statistic committee is uh, running analysis and monitoring of the goals of sustainable developments 
and we've issued four information and analytic compendiums that are showing the situation for performance of SDG. And I want to state here that for the CIS, we are using 111 KPI, 97 of them are common for all states, and 14 are specific for certain states and member states. And in the context of HIV, let us see what will be in 2020, because 2019, we have the results that are showing the increase in HIV infectious cases in uh, all member states of CIS and tuberculosis and hepatitis. Uh, B incidence is also showing positive dynamics, but it is a bit early to make any statements related to this, as I would say. As Alek Nikolaevich told, why is the topic of uh, the lecture this one? Because from the very beginning I told you that uh, on the CIA, uh, within the CIS, starting our struggle against COVID, we were using the way of cooperation within three international agreements, and as of now, at the end of the year, we have six international documents, and we are also planning, so taking into account the experience of uh, uh, the lessons learned from 2020, we want to start the corrective measures and introduction of changes into the agreement on HIV cooperation. And we are also correcting and will correct our work in filling in the project of the agreement on rendering of medical help to the migrants and members of the families of these migrants, working migrants. So taking into account all the experiences that we've gained and here the healthcare uh, council uh, within the CIS is working within the uh, uh, Coordination Council for Infection Diseases and starting from the end 2019 we went to the development of a uh, mixed document, the project of plan, with, uh, of plan of working with antibiotics and of course the international platform and international cooperation is the line of our efforts when we are doubling our efforts, when uh, the lessons learned uh, are learned and uh, the corrective measures are taken. And it's very important when we can see the results of our work and when our colleagues from other international organizations are cooperating with us distinguished colleagues. At the end of my presentation, I want to wish good health to all of you. I want to wish you success and free roads, free borders. Thank you very much. Yelena Vladimirovna, thank you very much for this very interesting report. It was very interesting to listen to the ever-growing role of the Executive Committee of the CIS as a platform for cooperation dialogue between different countries. And now this is also uh, UN and WHO. And for the last presentation within our session, I want to let the floor to the Dr. Dmitry Anatolyevich Lioznov. Director of the Research Institute of Influenza, Smarodinov Institute, Russia. Dmitry Anatolievich will join us in online. Dmitry Anatolievich, I hope you can hear us. Let us check the connection. Distinguished colleagues, do we have an established connection with St. Petersburg? We are now checking the connection. Dmitry, if you can hear us, you may start because we see your presentation on the screen. Dmitry Anatolyevich, could you please turn on your camera? I hope you can hear me. I will go on. Yes, so in the year 2017, the WHO and... Yes, I've started. Thank you very much for your patience. So, starting from 2019, the WHO defined 
the main risks. For public health, and you see the list of these main risks. You, you see that the half of these risks is bound. Unfortunately, we cannot hear the sound. So, and now I want to speak about influenza. This is a social. Uh, socially important disease, and we face the global strategy on flu for 2019-2030. Unfortunately, there is a sound glitch, and uh, still we can not hear the main presentation. Uh, he is on the general channel that we can hear very vaguely, but he should. Somebody should get him to switch to the Russian channel. Dmitry Anatolyevich, please choose the Russian channel because we cannot hear you very well right now. So the global strategy for flu for 2019-2030 has concrete defined goals. So to decrease uh, the uh, events of season flu, to minimize the risk bound to zoonotic types of uh, influenza and to uh, to deal with uh, the follow-up of patients and to provide for a follow-up of flu pandemics. This is our view of the strategy for 2030. Unfortunately, we still can't get the sound from the speaker, so we'll wait until the technical issues are addressed. Dmitry Anatolyevich, if you hear us, please switch to the Russian channel, please. Dmitry, if you can hear us, please switch to the Russian channel. Hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Can you please send a message to Dr. Lyoznov that we cannot hear him. Everybody can see your slides, but not hear you. You should switch to Russian channel. Unfortunately, we had some technical problems with St. Petersburg. I'm sure that Dr. Lyoznov will share his presentation and it will be available for the participants of this conference. I'd like to conclude and I also would like to organize. Can you hear me now? Yes. some correct link no you need to switch to russian channel there's a button interpretation on the bottom of your screen can you see that i see the record interpretation 
Так лучше? Все, все, все. Дмитрий Анатольевич, мы вас очень хорошо слышим. Сейчас меня слышно. How about now? Can you hear me now? The offline studio says yes, we can hear you. I hope, dear uh, participants online, that you can also receive our sound without any problems. So, the pandemic was announced because this is the absolutely new, not absolutely, but this is a principally new virus. It is different from those viruses that were present before, and it can be transmitted from one person to another person, and it can be spread globally. We don't have any immunity, or we have a very low immunity. And, for example, we had a situation back in 2009 when uh, the population, especially the population of aged uh, people, had some immunity to this virus. And uh, that's why younger people or middle-aged people suffered most. And. Um, we also see some clinical characteristics. So the pandemic doesn't depend on the season. Uh, the flu pandemic, also if we look back at 2009, we do remember that it didn't start uh, according to the regular season, as well as it ousted all other viruses that usually used to be present in the season. And so now the influenza or flu for us is quite a seasonal one. It has become a seasonal one. One needs to say that our meeting, so to say, with the pandemic potential can happen at any time. If we take a look at the history of uh, the last 20 years, then we will see that each year we identify some pathogens that do have the pandemic potential. Sometimes it is limited to animals, sometimes some uh, single cases of human infections are registered as well. But uh, here you can see 2009 and uh, there was a, a virus, uh, PH1N1, uh, and it has become the pandemic virus. Today, in the world, we have the uh, GISRS. This is the program by WHO. This is the one of the oldest ones and most successful ones. Uh, 121 countries participate in that. In some countries, there are even two national centers. For example, Russia also have got two national centers in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. We have uh, cooperating centers, reference centers as well. And within this uh, global uh, system of monitoring or GSRS, we have two subsystems, the traditional one and uh, some so-called signal uh, surveillance. So all these uh, systems, especially if we talk about the traditional ones, so we've had there for over last 50 years. So the methodological recommendations were published back in 1967. And over the last years, we drafted uh, three systems uh, and they are working in parallel. That's why we can say that this is the multiplex system, traditional signal and uh, hospital surveillance, three components. We have different uh, timelines, uh, different regions uh, in which we work. So traditional surveillance, uh, epidemiological surveillance, uh, 51 region, uh, are involved, regions are involved in that. Then the signal, uh, clinical epidemiological surveillance, uh, it was submitted uh, or proposed to uh, do in 2010, and this system started and was launched uh, back in 2010. And it had and still has 10 bases. And the hospital surveillance, it's been in operation for uh, seven years. And each year, we enhance uh, the number of uh, the hospitals that take part in that. Main goal here is to limit the negative effect of flu, as well as to communicate the information to the uh, 
authorities to limit the number of morbidity uh, and um, death rate. And uh, we've, we saw it on the example of the pandemic of COVID-19 last year. The system is being uh, continuously developed. And what I wanted to add that this is a continuous system. What does it give us? This is the early identification of pandemic viruses, then the identification of the beginning and the end of the seasonal epidemic or pandemic, then the uh, identification of etiology and uh, the severity. So this is not about uh, the clinical characteristics, but this is about the expression of this process. Last but not least, uh, we also aimed at uh, identification of the relevant uh, strains. So antigen characteristics uh, are identified across the whole world, and then the WHO issues recommendations to the producers uh, on the strains that should be included into the vaccines. So this committee gathers in February and uh, says which strain should be included into the vaccines. And so here you can see the routing of our information flow. It all starts with the clinics and uh, then it is all sent to the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing. Then the information is passed to the Research Institute of uh, uh, Flu. Uh, this is for the lab uh, testing and research for sequencing. And after that, on a weekly basis, uh, the the Federal Center of Flu Control submits this information to our Ministry of Healthcare, to the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Wellbeing. It passes all the information on uh, the flu. And uh, also our National Insti Research Institute passes this information to the WHO and its uh, regional offices. In our case, it's European office. So this system, and it was mentioned today within the International Health regulations. Uh, this information is passed uh, to the governing health bodies. As I've said, the system is being uh, developed continuously and today uh, we not only talk about the epidemiological data but also we do uh, the molecular diagnostics and phylogenetic analysis. Here Russia does not lag behind the colleagues and um, in 2015 and 2016 that uh, full uh, genome sequencing was introduced. We were the second country in Europe that did that and over the last season we were at the second place on the number of uh, sequenced uh, flu viruses among all the countries of the European region of WHO. And so this experience allowed us to respond to the challenge of COVID-19. We created a consortium on sequencing and uh, we got more than 82,000 of samples that were studied and as you know, the Russian uh, Institute of Epidemiology will accumulate all the data that we get on the sequencing of the coronavirus from the whole country. Then the signal surveillance. Here we get additional cl uh, information from clinics and laboratories. So this is an individual uh, approach. And uh, it is different from the traditional one uh, because the traditional one just registers the statistics. And signal surveillance currently is in operation in 19 hospitals and in 14 clinics in different regions and in different federal districts. Uh, this allows us to have more or less a full picture. The system of signal surveillance is quite a standardized one and it allows us to gather information that can be compared not only to different regions in this country, in Russia, but it can also be a large element in the chain of the world data. Uh, we have uh, patients with a severe respiratory infection. 
they are hospitalized and we get this information from hospitals and we also have patients with respiratory infection and those infections are treated in clinics and so we have criteria what is the uh, severe respiratory syndrome what is uh, just a standard respiratory virus etc and then we create an individual card uh, in the clinic or hospital where the patient is um, held uh, or treated we take into account the clinical picture the vaccinal status and uh, also the administration of antiviral medication and so in online regime it is all filled in into the database and uh, this allows us to use uh, all this information And this online format allows us to identify the etiology. And so it helps us not to overlook some case that could be quite dangerous and that has the epidemic potential. So here we can identify the risk factors because we get the data from the clinics, we get epidemiological and um, other types of data, demographic ones, for example. And we also try to assess uh, the effect of vaccination and uh, antiviral therapy uh, for these patients. All the data that we collect uh, is integrated in the system of traditional surveillance and uh, we integrate it and fill, in it, uh, fill it in in the international database. That's how we can compare our situation with the situation in other countries, because the system is quite a unified one. It is a, it is a simple, single one, and it was uh, suggested by WHO. For example, during the last season when we had flu, we surveil, surveyed uh, the severe respiratory infection, and we decoded the diagnosis for 36 percent of patients so 17 percent of all this was the different types of flu uh b flu then we also have uh, uh h1n1 and uh about 19 percent uh were suffering from some virus of another etiology And here we can see that uh, Rena virus and uh, Eras virus are uh, dominating here. And also the seasonal coronaviruses that we always have registered, they account for just uh, about 1% among those uh, patients that should be accepted into the hospital. Also, we can see the demographic data. So what infections are met in which groups of ages. For example, for children from 0 months to 12 months, uh, this is mostly A. And for other groups, uh, we see that other groups suffer more from uh, flu, especially when they are hospitalized. And uh, when it comes to the group uh, 65 years, Plus, we see that uh, Eras virus is also quite common among them, and they can suffer from some lung damage quite a lot. And so when it comes to the traditional and signal surveillance, so, well, we see the traditional system at the uh, upper part of the slide and the signal one at the lower, at the bottom of the slide. So the characteristics are all the same, but when it comes to the signal surveillance, this is more personalized and uh, it allows us to get the data from the clinic. So this is not only about epidemiological surveillance, but also about some clinical data. And another type of surveillance here is the hospital one. It is a quite a new and pilot project. We get the detailed characteristics of our patients since we have some large and extended survey for, for our, uh, for, or from our patients. 
unfortunately, you have just one minute to to uh, finalize. Okay, so uh, today we see that uh, some hospitals are participating in this pilot, uh, such uh, from such cities as from Saint Petersburg, Moscow, and last year we had about four thousand people uh, participating or patients participating in this project. So to conclude, uh, the global uh, system or GI. SRS is working. Uh, it allows us to identify the pathogen quite fast to help to develop the methods how to diagnose it. There is an interaction between all the organizations within the network, uh, including the international ones, and it allows us to exchange uh, the data on the laboratory diagnostics, on epidemiology, etc. Today, the system has been included into the diagnostics of COVID-19. And uh, I want to state that within this global system and the, with the support from WHO, we get the agents for diagnostics from WHO. And uh, it, uh, on the one hand, allows us to work for, for the benefit of our country. And on the other hand, we can also provide the global community with the data that we get. And uh, in the WHO strategy, it is mentioned that uh, jointly with the introduction of uh, international health regulations, the flu is still a priority, key priority. And we need to uh, develop our system of surveillance as well as uh, develop everything that is connected with the prevention of flu. And this is actually quite um, close to other pathogens of uh, infections and, uh, for example, COVID-19. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dmitry, for your very extensive and interesting report. Unfortunately, we don't have any time left for questions, so I'd like to very briefly sum up the conclusions of the session that we've held and uh, let's include it into our resolution of the OVA conference. So first, I'd like to state that the morning discussion has shown that no country, no single country, no single organization can face and address the global pandemic on its own. And in this respect, the networks, sub-regional, regional and global networks key a play a play a key role in response to when it comes to the response to the emergency. Enforcement and the development of regional, sub-regional and global systems is a priority task. And uh, this enforcement can be done as follows, through the training of uh, professionals, then the creation of databases, registries, the training of uh, specialist professionals. Secondly, we should also coordinate and communicate within the network and uh, within different networks. This is the key um, success factor, especially against the current pandemic backdrop. And definitely, we need to cooperate, uh, cooperate and cooperate. Thank you, dear colleagues. This discussion seemed to me very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good day and have a fruitful day at the conference as well. Thank you. Проходите, пожалуйста. Здравствуйте. Что, что? Ну, ради бога, пожалуйста. Уважаемые коллеги, продолжаем работать. Distinguished colleagues. We are working further because of the timing. Our session is devoted to epidemiology of new COVID-19 in the EECA countries. And I think I, I will speak as the first one. We are inviting the colleagues. We will start to speak about the Russian case of coronavirus infection.
So let me start from uh, the initial positions. 2019 gave us just a new task, and I mean 2020. Uh, COVID-19 is a new task for us, and uh, please put my presentation on. Uh, now I will speak about the Russian Federation, and further on I will speak about Belarus Republic. And we try to analyze uh, this topic also now, and the knowledge has no borders, and uh, in-depth study is just opening new uh, lines of study for us and I will just try to show you a certain epidemiological features and the approaches that are nowadays used in Russian Federation related to coronavirus infection. Now I will handle my presentation. And so let us commence. Uh, coronavirus, uh, coronaviridae are really known to the human hind from the very beginning. And we know that alpha coronaviridae are resulting in 10 or 20% of diarrheas in uh, the childhood, mainly. And we understand that everybody is now looking for beta coronaviridae, and we know that this is the third occurrence of coronaviridae in the 21st century, and nobody was waiting for such disastrous event related to this particular infection. As of now, I will now speak about the numbers, but you see they are really significant. In the world, we are now over 140 millions of infected persons. Lethality is more than 3 millions, and day-by-day -day accumulative effect of the virus is uh, uh, providing for median uh, uh, amount of uh, new cases at the level of uh, 600,000 cases and 15,000 uh, are dying. Uh, so we uh, day by day are changing the information. The maximum growth is in Sweden, in France, in Brazil, in Czech Republic, in Italy, in the USA, in Russia, in Great Britain and uh, in uh, Italy also. And I already specified that this is the case for Russian Federation also, and this is a acute case. The scale of uh, the disaster is identical on the planet Earth. On, in all countries, we see uh, pretty much the same epidemiological trend, which is represented here on this slide. And this particular slide that you are seeing right now is comparing the so-called spring of 2020 and the autumn rise that we are now living in until now and you see that this disaster is uh, uh, multiple times higher than we've seen it before and the dynamic of uh, the epidemiological process is related uh, to this curve on this slide there are different scenarios but uh, in a matter of fact uh, when we speak about the second wave or third wave in terms of russian federation we are not speaking about it because the classical definition of uh, a wave is zero peak and zero. Russia did not uh, cross the zero line in any situation, therefore we are speaking about uh, ever going, ongoing uh, epidemiological process, spring rise, autumn rise within uh, the first and the second year. We see all the age categories and the mortality is growing and coronavirus infection is also in included into this epidemiological process and there is only one exclusion in children. And when we speak about Russian Federation, as of now, we've surpassed the barrier of 4,700,000 registered cases, more than 106,000 uh, lethal cases. And as of now, when we assess the situation for Russia, we are going that we are uh, we're going through stabilization of peak processes with the tendency of a decrease. According to the overall registered new cases, we are in the fifth place overall morbidity uh, per 100,000 were on 69th place, absolute little cases 7th place, lethality 60, uh, 60th place and uh, mortality for 
100,000 uh, uh, people in population, we are on the 60th place. When we analyze all the age groups, we can see that all the age groups in Russia are subject to COVID-19. For children, we are estimating 11% of all new cases in 2020. The most vulnerable category were the children until one year and adolescents who um, resulted in the maximum registration in children. And in adults, we see the maximum uh, vulnerable category from 20 to 65 years old. And again, please put your attention to this, that within the group from 20 to 40 years, we have a prevailing share of males. And in the group of patients older than 45 years, there are more female. So the severity of cases is also represented by this trend. You may see it on the slide. We see that with the aging, we have more severe cases. The red part uh, is the acute cases on the diagram. And it is vividly shown starting from the age of 20. Again, I want to remind that the, the lethal cases are in all age group, but 65 plus age is the special category. We understand that when we speak about epidemical, epidemiological process, uh, we need to speak about laboratory diagnostics. No microbe, no diagnosis. I want to remind you that laboratory diagnostics in Russia is affected uh, within the sanitary norms and regulations on the previous slide. And as of now, we've made more than 125 million tests. Russia is on the plateau, 300,000 tests daily and as of now more of th more than 1000 laboratories in Russia state and private laboratories commercial laboratories are testing for uh, uh, RNA uh, covid uh, on the 16th of April Russia is among the five main countries in absolute numbers of the tests in the world why do we need testing and screening activities for SARS-CoV-2 at first asymptomatic forms of infection and, uh, you know, I'm 40 years in infectious diseases, and at COVID-19, we could describe by the means of the test the form of virus infection process that is playing a significant role in the infection. So early isolation of uh, the sources of infection, we need to decrease the intensity of circulation of virus, decrease the epidemiological risks in certain categories, monitoring of uh, changes and evolution of the virus, and monitoring of the uh, epidemiologically significant mutations. And as of now, there is a new situation for our Russia. We have registered 300 for test system for diagnostics of COVID-19. The Central Institute of Epidemiology that I represent is one of the developers of the key test systems. Let us start from the fact that in March we registered universal test system that provides for uh, COVID-19, MERS, and SARS-CoV-1. And this is the only one test system out of 300 test systems that provides for one moment etiology reactions. We are the only one developers of quant quantitative or definition of virus. There are no other products in the world. Why do we need to speak about quantity of uh, the virus here? It's very important for no symptom or asymptomatic low symptom form also that are sources for the infection. We need to test persons that are crossing the borders of Russian Federation at different stages of infectious process or at the end of incubation period. The quantitative Native system is uh, very important for forecasting, for screening or in uh, non-infectious uh, hospitals. This is also an additional test at the primary testing, and it can be used to assess the environment. By the way, uh, in 2020, the Central Institute for Epi of Epidemiology issued 75 million kits for definition and the share on uh, the market of test system is 83% for our institute. Yes, we've had s uh, some problems with reagents, with the plastic uh, parts of the test kits because of the lockdown, but the decree of the government of Russian Federation is fully executed. And on the 1st of April, we've reported 
the sufficient quantity of test systems that were designed and like revert and revert l and rebo prep reference um, tests are also issued and produced by our institute by the way what uh, was the way of work of the central institute of epidemiology in 2020 we've made 2 million tests by pcr to more than 250000 research by ifa more than 400 full genomic rna sequencing of the coronavirus and we could provide for a significant uh, support of uh, the vigilance and control over COVID in Russia and abroad. And there was also one important thing we needed to develop not only a test system, but to integrate the test system into the information sources. As of now, we see that we've created the system that is patented and it provides for obtaining of the results of analysis and during 24 hours to place the data at all platforms in uh, Gosuslugi State Services platform or EMEA system. And here, as of now, there are 16 regions working within this process and after we've got we get the positive or negative information on the test it is integrated into informational platforms that are represented here on this particular slide and i want to remind you that this integration to create this informational database is made within the decree of the government of russian federation what are the most vulnerable categories with the most often positive tests of covid of course these are pneumonia cases acute respiratory diseases and by the way, it was very important fact for us. We were seeing just the different contacts with COVID-19 here. As of now, the main goal of diagnostics is to decrease the time for plastic analysis, flexible analysis. And here, under this situation, our institute created a test system that is of now under licensing. Uh, this is LMP kit that provides for a significant shortage of analysis until one hour so we can shorten the time and also very important uh, epidemical uh, research is related to the mutations as of now we see that n501y mutation is the main part of the british mutation uh, south african brazil mutation and other mutations that are significant and in this situation, we may say that the British stem, and this is the so-called British because for the first time it was eluded at the end of August 2020, it is now seen in 101 country around the world. And this stem is uh, having increased contagiosity and uh, the mortality by 64%. South African stem, as of now, it is evident in 64 countries and Brazil and Japanese in 38 countries. Monitoring of the changes of the properties of the virus, uh, coronavirus is one of the most important uh, scopes of our work. And thanks to the Russian Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Well-being, our institute is running full genomic sequencing and bioinformation analysis that provides for forecast of epidemiological situation and analyze epidemiological landscape. I don't want to speak about why do we need to understand the study and study the mutation because we are uh, working, uh, we are protected from the body, uh, from the virus by antibodies and virus wants to live on and wants to cross the bo barriers. And the first barrier, the zoonotic barrier, is already cl closed and this is the pathogenic process. This process will go on and we want to put it on hold, of course. Uh, the very often mutations are seen in persons with chronic infections with uh, compromised immunity from time to time there is a classic zoonotic transfer uh, from the mammals in uh, persons with a therapeutic treatment uh, like a treatment with monoclonal antibodies or uh, serum treatment and by the way here I need to state that it's a very important moment here that after the introduction of virus in new population, we have a single variants, but then the variants may become contagi contagious and dominate. And as of now, all the research is uh, working with two locus, N501 and E484. Along the in the whole world, we are actively 
tracing this mutation. And we understand here that sequencing helps us to really monitor and assess the situation. And 15 Institute of the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights and Human Well-Being is uh, running full genomic or fragment sequencing. All these institutes are doing this work. And again, I want to say that we are assessing the landscape of distribution of coronavirus. And centrally, Institute of Epidemiology, according to the uh, ruling of the government of Russian Federation, is the main center that accumulates all information. As of now, we have web platform to load the analysis of data providing for the results of sequencing. And I want to remind you that before we were placing the results in the World Gene Bank, this was a good world practice. And as of now, we have a Russian platform that provides for tracing of uh, serum uh, changes in circulation of coronaviridem. And one of the information on the 15th April is registered in Russian Federation. So in Russia, we've registered British cases 192. South African uh, clades 21, zero of Brazil type coronavirus. But there is also a very interesting position. In 60 same patients, we've seen the mutations, important mutations, because we can be reminded that we've got the Western European and Siberian mutation that was seen in St. Petersburg, and their epidemiological role is now under assessment. So the countries of import of coronavirus, there is a first firm control. And from yesterday, I want to remind you that we have double PCR tests in interval five days, multiple or bound, combined. This is combined to the situation that is on this slide. And there are the countries from which we've got the imported uh, mutant uh, viruses. And here is the distribution on the territory of Russian Federation. It is also on the website of Rospatriebnadzor, Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being of uh, the British, of the Southern African uh, stems. And here you see the distribution of the stems like a mosaic, like a puzzle here. But there are some rules of distribution of mutant coronaviridae that we are naming the so-called British ones. A very important moment here is a phylogenetic analysis of uh, building of a gene three, tree and the tracing of the parts of the tree who are maximum distributed. As of now, on the basis of our institute, we've created the national registry for gene sequencing. And here it is the name of it. It is created from the 1st January 2021 and all institutes at the Rospatriebnadzor, Federal Survey Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights. Uh, they are providing for phylogenetic analysis and the, in yellow you see the British clade of the virus. Therefore, it's very important to provide operative analysis in uh, morbidity for COVID-19 and the uh, Central Institute, Research Institute of Epidemiology is the main institute here. It's providing for operative reaction. We are preparing day-by-day -day reports for Rospatriebnadzor. We are analyzing epidemic situation in Russia for uh, the longer and closer perimeter in the countries of the world. And we are also making short-term forecast for epidemiological situation in Russia. Uh, speaking about Moscow, we may understand that as of now for Moscow, we see the phase of stabilization with this tendency of decreasing of epidemiological process. Very important is the circulation of virus. Uh, we are not decreasing the quantity of tests, but positive probes, there are less and less of them. Uh, fortunately, but still the international criteria of um, epidemiology um, called state is the index. If it is more than one, we need to be aware of this epidemiological situation. And by the way, yesterday the city manager of Moscow stated that we wanted, of course, to have the index the RT index less than one, but the trend is unfortunately positive. Just a couple of words about the key element of prevention, because we understand that epidemiology and prevention are bound to each other by one chain. I will not speak about non-specific prevention that is, of course, clearly outlined and it it, it is a rule because in uh, the spring there was also criteria for Rospatriebnadzor developed for uh, lifting of the uh, lockdown uh, measures. And we understand that barrier method like masks, gloves, social distancing, 
uh, in the spring when there was no uh, vaccine, they could uh, help us with this problem. But I let us speak about vaccination. So in the world, there are different vaccines. In Russia, there are three of them. They are for spago, uh, uh, spago type uh, to not provide for adhesion of the virus and not to start the vaccine. Uh, the infection process, there are three vaccines registered, vector vaccine, peptide vaccine, and the classical vaccine. They are registered like Covivac from Chumakov Center. And the scope of vaccination as yesterday is here on the slide. We see we've got inoculation of 16 million doses. And speaking about the scope and uh, Russian is uh, in the third uh, dozen of the countries. And facing this situation, Russia, as a country in the Institute, see the following epidemiological task. We need to understand the longevity of uh, post-vaccination immunity and preservance of this immunity. Again, with this, we need to assess also in the decreted group the uh, times for revaccination if necessary and we also need to follow up the persons after disease and understand when after the case of the coronavirus we need to introduce vaccination and the key moment here is also the development of special test systems i want to remind you that for the diagnostics of coronavirus we are using test system for n protein or uh, nucleotides or domain binding receptors test systems that are assessing the post-vaccination immunity have a more fine, finer immunology features. Therefore, there is a mismatch. And uh, uh, after vaccination, if you want to provide, you get, get the tests, uh, uh, the amount of antibodies, you get the post-infectious bodies. And this is a bit of mixing. Of course, we are engaged in international activities. Let me not speak about this, but according to the decree of the government, we've passed 25,000 cases uh, for two and a half millions of tests for uh, more than 40 countries of the world. And we are working under the aegis of the Russian Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being for prevention and scientific and methodological support and diagnostics, of course. As of now, we're working with a line of international institutes like Robert Koch Institute. With Robert Koch Institute, we have a long-term, long-time scientific basis and platform to provide for research not only related to COVID-19. And this institute, Robert Koch Archai, is working under the aegis of WHO and other international events and agencies. And this is our inlay for 2020 in popularization and raising awareness on COVID, this is this, the publishing rate of information that we've got by analyzing the masses of epidemiological cases. And at the end of 2020, at, at the beginning of 21, we are working. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And let us hope, really, that... So we are at the end. We hope that we are at the end and we will finalize the case with COVID. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues, let us be co-chairs today while I am preparing my next presentation. I will let the, let the floor to Dashkevich Anna Mikhailovna, head of the Department of Epidemiology at the Republican Center of Hygiene, Epidemiology and Public Health in Belarus Republic, COVID-19 in Belarus Republic, the emerging of epidemic and measures to minimize the risks of disease distribution. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Let me th thank you for giving me the opportunity to take part in this conference. In the Republic of Belarus, we organized our work to counteract COVID-19 in the beginning of 2020. Proceeding from the study of the epidemiological situation as well as the WHO recommendations, added by data on new virus, the new virus, we created an uh, interagency working group led by the Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Belarus, and we developed and implemented the comprehensive plan of uh, measures how to prevent the bringing of the virus to the territory of our country. and. Uh, 
it provided for the cooperation between different governmental bodies. We conducted some activities on ensure the sanitary control for those who were crossing the border of our country. And uh, another set of measures was implemented to train when it comes to theory and practice, our professionals to make our medical organizations uh, ready for ident identifying and treating COVID-19 patients. And uh, we also provided uh, our framework of laboratories. We expanded our network of labs that were conducting tests. The first infection case in our country was uh, on the 20th 7th of February, proceeding from the epidemiological data, and uh, then uh, we were proceeding from the molecular data, and uh, we concluded that it was brought from Iran. And in March, we registered the infected cases in four uh, districts of the Republic of Belarus. They came from Italy and Portugal. And in the beginning of April, the two remaining territories of the Republic of Belarus uh, also were registered with some infected cases. So those cases weren't brought from abroad, but they were brought to these regions from other regions of Belarus. And during the 10th uh, through 13th uh, weeks of 2020, we registered infected cases mostly among those people who came from abroad, from Europe mainly, and those who were in contact who, with those who uh, came home. After that, uh, we identified that this, the virus uh, started to spread across the whole country. And uh, we had uh, two main waves uh, with the peaks. It, the first peak was uh, during the 20th week of 2020 and during the second week on 2021. And uh, from the beginning of March, we are registering the third wave, the third peak. So we see the upward trend. Currently, the mobility uh, has uh, stabilized for us. And currently, we have registered 346,000 of infected cases. Over the whole period of monitoring, we identified some cases of SARS-CoV-2 spread and we had the chains of infection transmission with a couple of generations. And here you can see a couple of clusters of the infected. The first case was registered among the patient or with the patient who first was in Europe. And uh, then uh, we also see some um, infected cases coming from work, from their home, from their families. And a couple of cases were also registered after the contacts in the medical organizations. Starting from the very first case and up until now, our professionals in the field of epidemiology and sanitary measures uh, track contacts and uh, organize all the measures necessary um, in those um, need eye of infection. And uh, on the one hand, this work allowed us to identify and track the chains of infectious uh, cases, and uh, it also allowed us to avoid uh, the extreme numbers of extreme of the infected cases. And uh, the majority of um, the infected cases were registered uh, in Minsk and Minsk Oblast. And on the one hand, it is connected to the number of people living there, so. Uh, the population of Minsk accounts for 37% of the whole country. And another uh, aspect here is that this is a mega city and it has a lot of neighboring territories. As to the structure of the infected people, more than 90% of cases were registered among adults. And uh, more than 65% were people of um, able bodied age from 18 to 59 percent and 29 cases were people were registered among people 60 years plus 60 years old plus and so the majority of cases among children are registered uh, among adolescents from 7 to, to 14 years and so in the Republic of Belarus to assess this uh, epidemiological situation from different angles and to make impo Im 
informed uh, management decisions. We monitor severe respiratory infections, pneumonias. Currently, as to the severe respiratory infections, uh, this is not an epidemic for us. But in 2020 and during some weeks of 2021, we've seen some changes in the structure of the infected cases uh, because in the past, mostly children suffered from that. But in 2020, we saw that there were some changes coming in the majority of weeks registered some infected cases among adults. As to pneumonia, more than 90% of pneumonias are coming from the viruses and more than 95% of pneumonias are connected and caused by SARS-CoV-2. Um, alongside with this, since 2020, we implemented an assessment of uh, the virus transmission of the of the COVID-19 among our population. We have a system of surveillance. It has been in operation for quite a long time, and we do the surveillance in 18 uh, regions of our republic. Uh, here you can see the results of our work on the epidemiological surveillance. And over the period that was monitored, we see that there is a combined uh, circulation of SARS-CoV-2 and uh, non-flu viruses. And currently, we do not identify any viruses uh, of, uh, of flu. And here you see the results on the lab testing, proceeding from clinical and uh, epidemiological parameters. We also test who go abroad. We also test people that are working in uh, state medical organizations as well as in the private ones. The Ministry of Health of our Republic identified the measures uh, and identified the laboratories that are allowed uh, to proceed with this testing. Our Ministry of Health taken into account the order by the Council of the Ministers and also to prevent the bringing in of the infection to our country. It identified the red zone countries that are quite risky ones and uh, we've developed the criteria and um, we monitor the COVID situation in these countries on a weekly basis, as well as the monitor the measures that are taken there. And we restructure the list of these red countries, red zone countries. We can add some countries, we can exclude some countries, as well as we can adjust the requirements um, that are set for those who come from these countries home. As to the legal framework. We also have done a lot when it comes to the prevention of COVID-19. Here you can see just a couple of um, documents within the regulatory framework. And here I would like to pay some special attention to WHO. Well, there was a set of documents and recommendations prepared on um, the work of our system of healthcare against the backdrop of COVID. We drafted methodological materials, videos. Uh, they highlight the issues of uh, PPEs use as well as the uh, protective clothes use. And as to the methodological base, uh, we drafted the recommendations on how the different production sites should function, those sites that conduct some economic activities. And so we provided for the functioning of these um, organizations, uh, even uh, when there were some COVID-infected cases registered. So we, for example, organized the summer activities, and it all allowed us to uh, proceed with the regular schedule of um, the health uh, centers that are functioning in the summer and no, uh, this, none of these units stop their activities. And the, the latest recommendations that we developed for COVID-19 situation, uh, it was uh, for some animals and um, we developed uh, recommendations uh, for those organizations who work with animals uh, and um, uh, some cattle. So the government of our republic developed and approved the vaccination plan. 
it all starts with the professional risk groups and uh, other risk groups and it ends with the vaccination of the whole population and we want to vaccinate 60 percent of our population currently we are finalizing the first stage of the vaccination and uh, currently we involve uh, more than 33 percent of our medical staff for the purpose of vaccination and uh, We've vaccinated uh, more than 70 people that are in uh, hospitals and uh, more than 18% of uh, pharmaceutical workers. Currently, we've vaccinated uh, over 2% of our population in total. So we have a, a, an extensive work to do in the future. So by this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and to wish you luck and health uh, with the fight against the COVID. OK, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, I believe that we will pose our questions from uh, where we are seated. Uh, we still do social distancing, or we can also write something uh, on a paper and then pass this paper to us. Now, I'd like to give the floor to Tatiana Bilichenka, the head of the Lab of Clinical Epidemiology Research Institute of Pulmonology. She'll be talking about major clinical and epidemiological features of COVID-19 in Moscow. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm very happy to welcome you. I'd like to wish you uh, to stay healthy, wish you some well-being uh, against this current uh, backdrop. And I would like to present you the data that we drafted on the main clinical and uh, epidemiological characteristics of COVID-19 among the Moscow population. For this, uh, I've used uh, the data uh, only the official data from the Federal Service for Surveillance and Consumer Rights Protection and Human Well-Being, the Healthcare Department of Moscow. We also used international sources as well as the Russian methodological recommendations that were drafted in January and February and then reviewed uh, on a regular basis by the Federal Service for Surveillance on Consumer Rights Protection, Human Well-Being. Uh, and uh, we also used some scientific sources and articles. And we also used some databases on the number of infected cases with COVID-19 in Moscow and Moscow region. So the novel coronavirus appeared, uh, announced itself on the 11th of December 2019 in China. We will remember this date forever. And on the 31st December 2019, the WHO knew about 425 cases with a severe pneumonia. And during 30 days, this disease was identified uh, across the whole territory of China. On the 11th of March 2020, during the briefing, the Director General of WHO stated that the disease became the pandemic since it spread across 99 countries. And uh, on the 11th of March 2020, Russia officially registered tw 20 COVID-19 infected cases of uh, some mild uh, state. 15 cases were registered in Moscow and uh, one case was registered with a child. Uh, and all these cases were brought to Russia from abroad. After that, the virus was studied thoroughly. The features of, its were, of this uh, were identified. And the pathogenic mechanism of this virus was uh, Proceeding from the contact with the uh, ACE2 uh, or transmembrane uh, glycoprotein uh, CD147. And uh, by this, the virus could uh, penetrate the cell, then start to spread. And uh, that's how the severe damage to all the organs uh, that included or cons consisted of this receptor started. And uh, ACE2 are present in the human's body, on the endothelial, epithelial cells, on the anthracytes, uh, in our intestine system, and uh, in many organs of ours, such as the heart, uh, the kidneys, our brain, etc. Also, it is present in the lymphocytes, uh, in the vessels, in the thelium, and macrophages. So all the organs where these receptors um, are located could be suffering. Uh, depending, of course, on the severity of the disease. 
So the dynamics of COVID-19 disease can be observed in here. You see that as of the 31st of May, Russia registered 405,000 people of the infected cases. And uh, well, the majority of this uh, accounted for Moscow. Then, um, talking about Russia as a whole, we saw the spread of COVID-19 among the population with a higher frequency as compared to the frequency in Moscow. Because in Moscow, we organized quite a high quality and strict system of um, epidemiological measures. This system allowed to rein in the spread of the infection But still, Moscow accounted for the most cases of the infected cases up to August 2020. And from the 31st of May through the 31st of August 2020, we registered some kind of a stabilization in Moscow regarding COVID-19. There was a downward trend in Moscow. And at the same time, we saw the raise in the infected cases in uh, the Russian regions. B people were coming from their vacation and uh, for example, children and aged people were coming back from different regions, Russia to Moscow. And in September, once again, registered the rise uh, in, the infect in the number of infected cases. And it was quite a sharp rise. It spread across not only socially active groups of population, but it also spread across children and uh, aged people. We saw that uh, the number of uh, the aged population or the par part uh, of the aged population has risen from 11% to 19%. And uh, the morbidity among children accounted for 11%. So we see that in Moscow, less people died from COVID-19 as compared to the whole Russia. It is mainly connected to the timely and proper treatment. So this is not only about the timely diagnostics, but also about the delivery of the medication, the work of um, the emergencies, the work of um, the mobile clinics, and uh, we continuously monitored patients through the remote centers. It was organized in parallel with the work of uh, COVID-19 hospitals across the whole territory of Moscow. The primary hospitalization of COVID-19 infected people was uh, done, according to the data from the information system, that surveilled the morbidity, we saw that 70% of patients were administered to the infectious units. And uh, the patients mainly were placed to the pulmonology units, then to the therapeutic units, and 0.3% uh, were hospitalized to the intensive care units. In addition to that, the patients were also taken to the gyne uh, gynecologist units, coloproctological units, to the phthisiatry units, and to other different units of different clinics. And uh, in the isolation, they were once again tested, the diagnosis was confirmed once again, and uh, they received the treatment or medication, or they were reprofiled uh, or transferred to another unit of an infections hospital. Here you can see that among 13,000 of people hospitalized to, to, to hospitals from the 1st of April through 25th of June 2020, 25% of all 
the infected people were hospitalized. And uh, the bad consequences uh, took place for those people who were suffering from different uh, chronic diseases. And uh, in addition to this, if there were some chronic diseases registered and identified, we also saw that there was a link with the age. So the older the people were, the more chronic diseases they had. Uh, you can see it represented in the red color on this slide. And the more frequently these patients uh, were observed with the very bad consequences of this disease. And uh, we see that uh, 10,700 people of those hospitalized uh, got over the virus and more than 1,000 uh, died from this virus. And uh, as to the uh, detailed uh, research of the diseased people of the lethal cases, during the third uh, day and uh, 65th day uh, after the people were infected with cov SARS-2, 69 male and 54 female patients were examined as to the uh, the 6th of June 2020. The frequency of such diseases as diabetes, the ischemic heart disease, the obesity, the lungs problem, uh, lymphoma, leukemia, some uh, cancer diseases, we see that the risk has risen. And so definitely, dear colleagues, uh, all these uh, diseases, like um, in other countries, because our colleagues in other countries conducted the same analysis, these diseases are the factors that result in a very bad uh, situation uh, within the COVID-19. And the dynamics of the death rate uh, of COVID-19 in Moscow, as well as in Russia, shows us that there was some rise uh, in the death rate as uh, it was assessed against all the official cases of COVID-19 among the population. And it can see, we can see that there was a, a down, an up, upward trend up to the 31st of August. At the same time in Russia, lethality arrived at the level 1.73% and in Moscow, it even exceeded this number. But fortunately, at the, the beginning of September, on the 5th September, namely in 2020, the mayor of Moscow uh, announced that Moscow starts the round of vaccination of the high-risk uh, groups uh, in terms of COVID-19. These are medical staff. Uh, persons uh, related to serv to servicing of uh, people having coronavirus and also people who are at the nursing homes um, for elderly people or for disability uh, people with disabilities by the use of a new vaccine that was ready at this time to be used uh, broadly further on step by step there was an increase in uh, vaccination scope and as you can see, at the end of November 2020, we arrived at a decrease of not only morbidity of population in Moscow, but also decrease in morbidity along Russia and decrease of uh, the lethal lethality, so lethal, lethal outcomes that was related and uh, conditioned by vaccination, by thorough work of sanitary epidemiological agencies, and in time uh, drafting of clinical recommendation, proper training of doctors, of medical staff, huge events uh, of mass raising awareness in population in all aspects with pain-free uh, um, covering of all issues that were faced by the population, which resulted in the betterment of sanitary epidemiological regime, better treatment of our patient, and rendering better healthcare services in clinical departments that were working with this patient. Unfortunately, distinguished colleagues, when we are arriving at better results, we are losing our vigilance. At, at the end of the March, you see that this curve is rising, not only in Moscow, although the rise is insignificant. Lethality uh, was uh, up to 
54, but also in whole Russia, because we see the new times when the people are gathered, there is a not so cold on the street, there is an increased social activity, and this is also playing its own role on these indexes. At the end of my presentation, I want to tell the things that you already know, colleagues, that infectious disease, COVID-19, is affecting whole population, all ages, but the unfavorable outcomes are faced by the people of the elderly age with chronic diseases. The execution of anti-epidemic uh, measures it should be obligatory for all people whether you had your own flu shot or not, whether you had a case uh, in your history of coronavirus and so on, because we need to finalize the epidemic process. We need to regularly review and better up the methodology recommendation and introduce the achievements that we have for the last year in coping with this infection, it increases the quality of medical uh, help and control of the disease. And vaccination, by the way, the broader, the vaccination is, the broader layers of the community will be fa facing vaccination. Unfor unfortunately, we have the active vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 virus, it will result in the decrease of lethality and mortality, morbidity rate, not only in populations in huge manufacturing cities with um, a high rate of contacts, uh, social contacts, but also in villages. According to the data of the Department of Healthcare in Moscow that are officially published on the website of the department on the 31st March 2020, it was stated that according the 2021, I mean, uh, that uh, according to the results of the tests in Moscow, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 were evidenced by 44% of Moscow citizens. Therefore, colleagues, I want to remind you that with a person who can be diseased by coronavirus infection, we, need, we can meet this person every day in Moscow because there are more than a half of them, and clinical measures for us is the way for us to survive for the future. Distinguished colleagues, now you see all the information uh, agenda. Get your vaccine and choose your health. And I want you to choose health and to wish you good luck. Distinguished colleagues, thank you very much for your kind attention. Tatiana Nikolaevna, thank you. So, Mikhail Andreevich Gatkov will provide us with the report on the issues of organization of a work of a high-profile screening laboratory uh, under COVID-19. I beg your pardon because I am not fully naming the uh, persons, but this is one of the leading specialists and they are representing different scopes. Distinguished colleagues, greetings. I am representing the service that is uh, working on the basis of uh, diagnostics of coronavirus infection. And I want to thank uh, the chair and the organizers for uh, introduction and for invitation of our service today because we want to share our experience here and tell about some interesting uh, experiences. Just let, let us have some fun today for you to feel what uh, was laboratory service making. So I am uh, representing the Sklifosovsky Institute, uh, the ambulance uh, support, and our laboratory was among three biggest laboratories in Russia that have seen the laboratory, the, the major laboratory loads. And as you told, as the chair told, the laboratory executed more than two million researches for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Our laboratory has one and a half millions of tests, but it's also a significant amount of research. So yes, I could manage this. So what did we face? So for a long time, I work with laboratories in the system of uh, the healthcare, and I am also the veteran here. And what we have seen, there are no rooms for laboratories. 
we needed specialized rooms, many of them in, the, in a rapid way. There was not so much gadgets, even in the whole world. There was a lack on in equipment. It's a fantastic thing, really. All of the gadgets were manufactured by pieces and they were sold out by the manufacturers. All the systems of healthcare around the world were pursuing so certain gadgets. And there were real competition on who will be the first one to buy the gadgets. Okay, gadgets, hardware is 50%. Uh, but what about reagents? And uh, um, here I want to thank the Institute of Epidemiology in Russia and to all test systems developers. Because for me, as I have uh, great experience here, this was the fantastic situation because in a matter of days, there was a uh, this uh, there was a new diagnostics yes of course there was a high percentage of non-specific reactions but they were working still and in the matter of no time we managed to make a diagnostics uh, real and this is the humanitarian experiment of the planet because we are now facing a revolution in medicine because this is the way of solidarity and of the overall world reaction on the epidemics. Today we were listening to our colleagues from Belarus Republic, and we need to say that we have pretty similar dynamics and pretty similar actions. For the first time we are coordinated so rapidly, and at the same time the coordination was not done on the level of uh, uh, state agencies, but on the level of scientists, per se, of our level. And the third moment, there were no um, staff Nobody knew how to work with these new methods. Uh, no doctors were trained to this. And physically, we had no such quantity of people. But the main idea is, Alexander Vasilich was telling about this, we've lost the history of fighting against huge epidemics. There was a negative theory distributed, like the ep epidemics are not the case of today, that infectious diseases are something... Uh, out of the range and the world was not prepared to the epidemics and epidemics went to us and I'm afraid that this is not the last epidemics and there were many no's of such uh, such kind and this is a complex set of problems it is enlisted here this is not a full complex but it was faced by the laboratory services of the whole world and we did not know how and what to diagnose who needs to be diagnosed in the first line there were no to the spectrum we did not know so ideology very rapidly, the government of Moscow, in a matter of days, defined that you don't have to run diagnostics in all laboratories. You have to create a huge laboratory to provide for mass screenings. And independently, and this, by the way, was also revolutional, um, independently from the means of uh, um, whether it was private or the state, we used the private laboratory. I was at the on the key meeting at Rakova, vice mayor of Moscow, and she told us, "Tell us what do you need? We will buy everything." We told, "We will we will need uh, gadgets." They told, "We will bring you the gadgets," and they brought the gadgets, although the price was high. So we needed to provide for payments for the stuff. Yes, they told that for this group of laboratories, they will pay everything. And Moscow paid for everything. And we needed to uh, create laboratories of different tiers. We could not create the same laboratories. Therefore, we created the ideology of multiple level laboratories in Moscow. At the same time, the load for these laboratories should be equal to the level of this laboratory. They could not define or they could not run this uh, the same amount of tests. On the first step, we did not know who needs to be checked. We needed, we defined that uh, there are an indications. We don't need it to create panics like everybody, let's go and get your tests. We need to make this definition. We needed to create the flows of patients to understand what are the flows of contingents of uh, risk groups and load on laboratories. For example, in Moscow, we created a staff, and the staff was led not by the Department of Healthcare, but by us. I know in details a person who every evening sat there and defined what will be the load for every laboratory on each day. 
on every laboratory and we knew what are the laboratories that we will work with which agencies and this was a titanic amount of work we needed to uh, contact polyclinics take the materials invite uh, the representatives then uh, provide for uh, the gathering of all the probes to us and uh, we had the new deliveries at 10 o'clock in the evening and we were working in night shifts because Rakova deputy head was telling us that in 24 hours we have to get the results not later so the spectrum of scope the scope of research we will understand this on the first level the RNA test and very important is also the test for antibodies. It is also very important work also in terms of epidemiology. And so what should be these laboratories? Nobody knew about what the laboratories should be. I will tell you about this a bit later. So PCR tests. I am the head of a huge uh, department at Sklifosovsko Institute. This is an inter-regional inter laboratory, a very huge laboratory. We ran PCR tests before COVID-19 from 20 to 50 research. We worked five days a week and we had only two specialists who were working with this method. And Rakova told us that in two weeks we needed to define two and a half thousands per 24 hours. We needed to work 24 seven and we've made it. We needed to create the independent branches and departments on the basis of the existing collectives or create new ones. And we've managed to solve this task. What about the scope of a research? As I told you, our laboratory made from 20 to 50 research uh, researches. By the way, uh, initially, the uh, PCR is not a screening was not a screening it was not used as a mass research but the whole world was forced to put it into the rail of mass production and the huge amount was the testing of 300 probes i met chinese colleagues uh, and uh, one of renowned specialists told me you know we are making 300 probes and at the moment we've told that we are making 5000 per 24 hours and he told me impossible and then I showed, I showed how our laboratory works, and we've achieved the result of 10,000 tests per 24 hours. So from 20 in 24 hours, 20 probes to 10,000. What is the maximum that is possible? Okay, I know there there are laboratories. I will not provide for PR of the colleagues, they, but these laboratories are providing for 20,000 per. 24 hours. Of course, this is another organization of manufacturing, of laboratory tests. These are different technologies. But at the same time, the loads and the loads cannot be distributed equally for all laboratories because, again, these laboratories is laboratory of Institute of Epidemiology, our laboratory. There should be not dozens of them, but they should be reserve laboratories. They need to persist and work on. I will tell you about this later. We understand that immune hemiluminescent analysis is something else, but still we have the gadgets and hardware and we are able to make uh, several thousands um, of research. Now we are making 5,000 of research and we may make up till 30,000 of such kind of research. What about the, um, the venues? This is also very interesting. When we arrived at the question that we need two and a half thousand tests per day, we told that we have the amenities, we have the venues, and we need to rework them. Okay, they told us uh, from the government of Moscow, high class uh, specialists will restore everything, but you will work. Okay, we worked. We were covering the gadgets and uh, we were covered uh, by polyethylene and the guys, the other guys, they were uh, putting ventilation, cabling and so on. So there are also videos of this. And this was the work on the basis of 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We together with the builders and, you know, together with you, together with all of us, we were 
making something heroic because this was the epoch of heroes we were working together and we needed to support the flows the materials should be distributed within one flow and we described to the builders and construction workers as how we see the material should go into the laboratory from the moment of entering the laboratory until the this deactivation of the material of course, there were no projects, as you understand. Nobody was stating this. Everybody uh, was working 24-7. And also reagents, reactive materials. These flows were outlined on the papers A4, for example, how the information will be uh, distributed, where uh, we will take off our code and when we will take the materials from patients because we were also admitting patients. And correspondently to this, we were creating the logistic chains. We were making an outline with this, not two or three people, we were in consultancies with our colleagues. It can be doctor, it can be assistant or administrator. It did not play a role. They're very important was the timing of of uh, the steps because one step you can make it uh, in a very rapid way but it can result in a problems on the next step and we needed to synchronize work on every steps. And we made the spaghetti analysis the movement of staff along the laboratory and of course a very important aspect was the questionnaire of uh, the workers uh, who are working here and we were asking whether it will fit or not and when we told that it won't fit some solution won't fit it was rebuilt reconstructed on the next day specialized rooms we need specialized rooms uh, for um, productive minimum. We created for a comfort uh, um, amenities, uh, additional light, air conditioning, and so on. On the day 10 or 15, there were working, workers approaching me and they told me, is this, it is okay, but what, what to eat? And we've, uh, asked restaurants to support and the restaurants were delivering food 24 7 and you know then I went to the department and uh, they told me we uh, cannot we are not able to uh, to provide for this and even uh, with the hot meals three times a day the operators of the laboratory are getting this because you know the people need to work in the comfort heroism, heroic work can be a day, two days, a week, but not a year. And of course, complex use of technological amenities, technological rooms. These are rooms for um, cold storage, for uh, storage, uh, and so on. Hardware. Of course, when we worked with hardware, we needed to work with the automatized and manual methods. And we understood that they are giving us the uh, equipment, but we don't have any, uh, any knowledge on how to work with the equipment. And we needed also to understand how to use the manual methods. And along with this, we understood that the test systems will be changed. We will get different test systems, and we needed to be adapted to these changes in particular. Therefore, manual methods were also foreseen in our scope of work and correspondently. The load was defined according to the value that was prescribed for the uh, laboratory. Well, what about the staff? As I told you, uh, at the initial stages of pandemic, there were dozens of people. But then we had a training of 250 people, uh, about 100, uh, well, 250, and 150 are working right now. And we were collecting the stuff. We did not know what are those people. And those people did not know what they will do. We knew that they have diploma and certificate. The majority of them were not aware of how PCR works. They needed to be trained, and in 24 hours they had to start the work. And this was a surprise for us because they've managed to do this. There are many different people in the laboratory. I did not know who they are, but I had to leave them for the night shift. I could not stay there every night. And we create mixed brigades, for example. The one who worked for four to five days, he or she was the elder one. He was just the leader of the shift. This is this is like an on a war. You know, like the newcomers after one week, if you survive, you are the old guy. 
And by the way, the people had different goals. Somebody was uh, searching for money, somebody was an altruist, somebody wanted to work for the fame, and we needed to choose this. This is a very important step, and we need to work on this, and I hope that the leaders of some collectives, some staff groups will listen to me, because the situations will be the same. We need to be prepared. We need to work with the psychology of collective, of uh, the staff, uh, in under this extreme situation. Majority of people who went to us, they understood that they are here for a time. So what can you ask from the person who works this part-time job? And this was the job for a night, and many people did not want to work uh, these night shifts. They wanted to work in the other shifts. And this was a huge share of liability for us, because we were working with diagnosis. How did we address all that? From the very beginning, when we got a new person, we wanted to provide for the understanding by this person what is his or her goal and what is his or her functions. The newcomers should understand uh, what the team is doing as a whole and what uh, they should do. Well, of course, uh, we had some changes in our personnel uh, and uh, we had to lay off only two people and uh, we couldn't allow them for more. So all these decisions are quite important. Why? Because proceeding from the data from the world literature and uh, I also believe in that, that we will face some more pandemics, unfortunately, in the future. And what infections we will face and uh, what we'll have to respond to, unfortunately, we do not know anything about it. So, on the one hand, we have to preserve these uh, fundamental labs that will allow us to identify some pathogens and uh, to conduct some screening. And on the other hand, we also have to preserve all the technologies and methods how to fight against the massive pandemics. And uh, everything that has been mentioned today should be taken into account. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, our next report will be by Elena Meskina. Uh, she'll be talking about clinical and epidemiological analysis of disease in children of the Moscow Oblast. Distinguished Alexander Vasilievich, distinguished colleagues, uh, good afternoon. I would like to present you the data on the Moscow region, Moscow Oblast, in other words. So this is the second largest region after Moscow. It is close uh, by to Moscow. And in these two regions, in Moscow, in the Moscow Oblast, uh, the pandemic in Russia started. We have over um, almost two million uh, people and uh, the children account for about 20 percent. In total, we registered more than 230,000 cases and uh, 18,000 were identified within children, so it is less than 8 percent. So we do see that children suffer less from COVID. As to the dynamics of the morbidity, it uh, showed some exponential growth uh, also among people or among children. It uh, happened in April, then the morbidity rate stabilized. This trend is uh, quite a characteristic, a natural one for Moscow and the Moscow Oblast. So, among 100,000 children in Moscow Oblast, uh, about 15,000 were infected. And here you can see the geographical picture of the virus spread. And you see that those regions that were closer to Moscow suffered more, and those who are further from Moscow suffered less. But uh, this is not the only aspect that we should take into account here. So if we take a look at the morbidity level, then we can draw a conclusion very clearly that the morbidity rate uh, was higher in those or on those territories uh, with a more dense population. But we also see that there are different factors that can affect the morbidity rate. Here you can see the proportion by sex 
Well, on the one hand, it seemed that adolescents suffered more from COVID, but if we take a look at different group uh, groups of age or by age, uh, well, the groups uh, were affected quite in the same manner. We see that the children under one year old suffered more, but uh, they uh, got over it in quite a mild form. So indeed, uh, children under one year old uh, got infected more frequently, but they do not suffer more than others. So in total, starting from April through the March 2021, 40 cases are asymptomatic. And uh, during the start of the pandemic, it accounted for 60%. Uh, as to the pneumonia among children, well, not a lot of cases. In the beginning, it accounted for 20%. And uh, very, very rarely, we identified some severe forms of pneumonia. So indeed, uh, we had just about 60 cases. So judging by proportion, this is not so much. And when it comes to the sources of the pediatric morbidity, we see different, indeed, uh, sources of foci. 75% uh, of children got infected in the foci. And uh, when we talk about the, the family foci and uh, the sources, and um, the just public public foci, then we see that people or children mostly got infected uh, within their families. It accounted for 75%. So on the left side of this, you can see the morbidity rate by months. And uh, in the right, you can see very clearly that when the morbidity dropped uh, during the summer, we saw at the same time that the proportion of children under one year old grew. And we can also see that in the beginning of autumn, adolescents suffered more, so their proportion risen or rose. Well, this is quite understandable because they went to school and uh, some other educational facilities, uh, and no measures were introduced during those times. If we take a look at the A graph, then we can see the monthly uh, cases. And the red line is the share of children in the total number of all people infected. And we see that the number of cases is decreasing and the share of children is rising in parallel with this. I believe that this is mostly connected to the fact that uh, children are are a focus of our attention and uh, we continue to monitor them during all the stages of the pandemic. And what I would like to draw your attention to is that when during the summer the morbidity rate uh, fall or fell, especially in August and September, it is visible. I believe that this situation requires some additional analysis. So we didn't only experience the change in the age structure, but we also experienced some change in the forms. I mean, the mild forms and severe forms. I believe that it should be analyzed. And if we take a look at the share of uh, children hospitalized uh, among the total number of children infected, we see that when the, there is an upward trend uh, among children, then the number of hospitalizations, uh, when there is downward trend uh, among uh, the infected cases, in parallel, uh, it is followed by an upward trend uh, by uh, or in the hospitalization of uh, uh, children. So what I would also like to mention here is that if we take a look at the age, then I believe that the morbidity among babies, we can see it here. This is the marker of the growth in infected cases. So when we, we experience some growth uh, of infections among babies, then it will probably result in the rise among the whole population. And so this monitoring, the surveillance and epidemiological monitoring showed that, in general, children suffered less and got infected less as compared to adults. And if we take a look at these graphs, then we can, say, we can see that 
well, those who had some contacts with uh, some people infected, uh, they got some immunity. So, dear colleagues, I would like to support all the calls of uh, our colleagues that we should get vaccinated. So the analysis shows that the pandemic development is a complex one. Uh, it proceeds from the number of a set of different factors, and these factors change in parallel with the epidemiological process, and it also changes by seasons. And of course, the approach of patients towards the pandemic can affect it quite a lot. And so, of course, it all influences the indicators that we register. So indeed, uh, children get infected less frequently than adults. Then we see the very even uh, age structure. We didn't register any differences uh, per age when it comes to the morbidity rate and death rate. Uh, well, children of all the ages uh, get over the infection in the same manner. Also, we didn't register any dependency on uh, the age when it comes to the severity of a disease. We didn't see any spike or any rise um, in the pandemic among children as of today. And the share of pneumonias has all, always been the same. If we track it by day, by week, by month, doesn't matter. And so, as I've said, children mostly get infected uh, in their family, and uh, children get infected at school less frequently despite the very close contacts, but still uh, apparently the contacts at school are not so close as in their families. Okay, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, we will uh, consume a bit of your time uh, because we have another report to present to you. And uh, I give the floor to Arsene Arakelana, the Director of Institute of Molecular Biology of National Academy of Science, Republic of Armenia. And uh, he'll be talking about the molecular genetic analysis of SARS-CoV-2 in clinical samples by methods of nanopore uh, sequencing. Okay, thank you very much. I still will try uh, to to be brief here. First, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be presenting. And now, I'd like to present you the work that we conducted jointly with the National Center on the Prevention and Control of the Diseases. Our institute uh, works within the system of the Academy of Sciences, and from the very beginning of the pandemic in Armenia, which is March 2020, we started to cooperate with the Ministry of Health of our Republic, and in particular with our CDC. So, the data on Armenia. The first case was registered on the 1st of March uh, 2020, and as of the 15th of April 2021, we have uh, 206,000 confirmed cases. Currently, about 16,000 people are treated night, right now. The number of uh, deaths uh, is almost 4,000. So, when it comes to this pandemic and the fight against this pandemic, uh, I can think that this uh, is a triumph of the sequencing methods. Because from the very beginning of uh, all this, sequencing played quite a role. And they allowed us to identify very fast the virus itself, to uh, sequence it uh, fully when it comes to its genome. and uh, it laid the foundation for PCR tests. It also allowed us to analyze the evolution of the virus as well as the circulating genetic lines. We studied the adaptation and it all helped us to develop the vaccines. So all the areas that are now quite actively used uh, or all the methods that are currently used in the fight against the coronavirus, it all proceeded from the sequencing methods. If uh, briefly we will take a look at the technologies, well, 
we have the sphere of application for each of the technologies and we have of course the sets and protocols in connection to the uh, coronavirus. Uh, so we see that uh, there is the first, the singer uh, sequencing. This is the gold standard. But it is highly uh, precise. It has some lengthy reading, but it has a low throughput. And the Sanger sequencing also allows us to conduct with the S gene screening and the screening of those mutations that are connected to the uh, contagiousness. So of the virus. So the gold standard, the golden standard uh, during the pandemic was the sequencing of the next generation NGS uh, sequencing. It is uh, very precise. The cost uh, is uh, quite normal, but uh, the readings are quite short ones. And also, we didn't have uh, enough equipment for this. Uh, for example, uh, we lacked some equipment uh, for PCR, some agents, etc. And we also lacked uh, this, uh, this equipment for this type of sequencing. And also, the protocol is not an easy one, and one has to have some quite an experience uh, to do all this. And uh, one should spend a lot of time to get adjusted to the protocol and the laboratory. And uh, nanopore sequencing methods uh, are also moving forward. First, uh, it could resemble some just toy or simulator that you can show to school students or university students, but we turn them into a, a tool also to study the virus, uh, especially during the pandemic. And when it comes to nanopore sequencing, uh, it has an advantage of long readings. So uh, you can have some very large part of the genome with a good coverage. As to the library drafting preparation for nanopore sequencing, uh, this process is quite simpler as compared uh, to the sequencing on the Illumina platform, for example. But where, where there are advantages, there are also disadvantages. The nanopore sequencing uh, is not as precise as the previous methods that I mentioned. But we can provide for some full coverage or good coverage. And uh, if we combine, uh, for example, nano poor sequencing and sequencing uh, for Illumina, then we can get the coverage of genome of 99.9%. 99 .9%, so it is quite a good result. For our study, we used the protocol that was had been already validated by a lot of scientific groups across the whole world. Well, I will not stop and pause uh, and tell you about workflow a lot. So we got 36 clinical samples that we got uh, on the 22nd and 29th January of this year and the 18th of March 2021. Uh, so it was a, the randomized study but uh, we had quite a uh, high CT uh, on PCR results. So we prepared our library proceeding from the method that had been described quite a long time ago. We used uh, Arctic panel. It provides the primaries for NGS as well as nanopore sequencing. So we used uh, uh, Minion equipment. It's quite a small piece of equipment. It just uh, looks like a USB stick. So we done it for from six to eight hours and the average coverage uh, of the genome was the 350x per nuclear, nucleotide uh, and um, our specialist in the field of bioinformatics developed a pipeline for the preparatory analysis of data. So actually 
first we do the pre-sequencing then sequencing and then we analyze the variants that were identified in our clinical samples and we identified the viral lines and analyzed uh, whether the mutations that we found can influence on the efficiency of the connection of primers between uh, PCR and sequencing especially we were interested in those PCR tests that are currently used in Armenia as uh, of January 2021, uh, January 21st and January 29th, 90% of all our samples identified uh, the lineage uh, 11163 and uh, according According to Pango lineage, this is called the Russian lineage because this lineage was uh, found in Russia mostly. In all the lineage, we saw some standards muta standard mutations. We identified it in May. And in this line, we can see some mutations that are quite characteristic of uh, the UK a strain or 117 and uh, in March the situation has changed or ha changed a lot out of 12 samples that were sequenced sequenced uh, 10 identified the mutation of 117 and uh, we could compare it proceeding from the Panga system to the UK variant. So we see that the situation with variants in Armenia has changed a lot. And if we compare the number of mutations across these lineages, then we can say that uh, when it comes to 11163 lineage, then the number, the average number of mutations per genome is much lower if than or as compared to the UK variant of the coronavirus. We conducted the phylogenetic analysis of these lineages, proceeding from the uh, GSIDA and other database. Our genomes are characterized all within the one branch they were quite similar to the Europe. Taking into account the airway traffic, we can probably suggest that the transmission of this virus uh, to Armenia was done through Europe to Russia to Armenia or just from Russia to Armenia, uh, because this kind of a uh, lineage is commonly identified in Russia. On the other hand, uh, the phylogenetic analysis of the uh, sequencing of 117, the UK strain or variant, we can see that uh, our genomes are clustered in different uh, branches of the, this tree, phylogenetic tree. So some of them are clustered in Europe, some of them with the same sequence are found in Asia and Africa. And uh, we can see that there are different traject trajectories of transmission of this lineage in Armenia. The most important question that interests almost everybody who work uh, in, in a lab is whether the mutations can influence the PCR accuracy as well as sequencing. So we also conducted an analysis to identify whether our mutations are located in the regions on primers. And uh, we see that a lot of mutations are localized on primers that are recommended by Arctic Protocol. And we observed it also during the sequencing. We've got some fragments with quite a low coverage of the genome. And we use uh, PCR sets that are proceeding from the CDC uh, primers from China and uh, the American CDC as well. And so we studied whether the mutations can influence uh, these uh, regions of primers. 
so we've identified mutations in 12 samples for N gene primer, both forward and reverse ones. All the mutations that we found were localized within the uh, five ends of this, and so it shouldn't influence the accuracy of PCR. And uh, the samples that we identified and selected were positive along two channels, so for N gene and for the other gene. And our results confirmed uh, our suggestions. And a lot of mutations we identified also for primers that were designed for E gene. And uh, some of these mutations were quite close to the site of this primer and it can influence the results of the analysis of PCR. And, uh, well, most sets that we use in Armenia, they target the N gene or ORF1 gene. So, what conclusions can we draw to sum up? Well, in general, uh, the strain, the UK strain, uh, got to Armenia uh, in February, March 2021. I'm talking about B117. So, those mutations that we found in the genomes of our clinical samples do not influence the accuracy of PCR tests, but we still need to continue these studies. So we have to extend our selection of samples. And um, the regular and periodic uh, genome sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, strains is necessary for the monitoring of the epidemiolog uh, epidemiological situation, and the nanopore sequencing is the reliable and accessible alternative for molecular and epidemiological uh, study uh, if there is no access to NGS platform or the access is uh, quite difficult to obtain. Hereby, I'd like to thank my colleagues from different uh, scientific institutions that helped us to conduct our work, and also hereby I'd like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, do you have any questions to our presenters? If you don't have any questions, then I'd like to thank everybody, each and every speaker, for their presentations. And uh, I would like to invite everybody to come to the National Congress, the 13th Congress on the uh, Infectious Diseases, uh, named after Mr. Pokrovsky, on the 20th Starting on the 24th of May, it would be will be conducted in the Radisson Slavanska near the Kievsky ra railway station. So we still have, of course, some limitations of a 50% filling of the uh, room, but still we hope to meet you over there. Thank you.